Good afternoon and welcome to the White House. We're honored to have each and every one of you here with us today. We organized today's event to coincide with National Women and Girls HIV AIDS Awareness Day, and we anticipate that this event will engage discussion among community groups, local health organizations, adolescent and teenage girls, national organizations, and research experts for a meaningful conversation on HIV and its impact among women and girls. So just a few housekeeping notes. Um, the men's restrooms are straight out this door. If you go straight down the hallway past the staircase, the men's restrooms are on the right. Um, and the women, you have to work for this one. So the women's restrooms are straight down this hallway. So you're going to leave this room. You're going to turn right. You're going to go all the way down the hallway. And you're going to pass a corridor. Don't go straight past that corridor. You're going to hook a right around the corridor, and the restrooms will be on the right. So um, good luck finding those. <laughs> um, so today's meeting is actually being recorded and live streamed from www.whitehouse.gov slash live. Um, and this recorded meeting will be posted on our website, the Office of National Aid Policy website at www.whitehouse.gov slash ONAP, O-N-A-P. So now it's my pleasure to introduce Jeff Crawley, Director of the Office of National AIDS Policy. Jeff? Great, thank you. Good, hello everybody. It's my pleasure to welcome you to the White House. I also would like to acknowledge Chantelle Britton, so who you've just met. She's on detail from CMS, and she leads our work on women's policy issues in, in our office, but she's also, she comes from CMS, the Medicaid office, and so she's a healthcare expert, and she leads our health policy work in, in the Office of National Aid Policy, so thanks for all your good work. We also are, are very um, happy to be joined by um, one of our biggest champions, and that's um, Congresswoman Donna Christensen. She'll be sp speaking to us momentarily, but you know, she has a long track, or, track record of working hard on so many issues, but she's been one of the strongest advocates for people living with HIV in the Congress, and so we're grateful for her work, but also really pleased she can join us today. I also just want to acknowledge that our partners in pulling together this meeting. So the Office of National AIDS Policy didn't do this alone. We were happy to um, work with the White House Council on Women and Girls. And later in this meeting, we'll be hearing from Tina Chen, who's the Chief of Staff to the First Lady, but also the Executive Director of the Council. And then also, we worked very closely with the HHS Office of Women's Health. So we're really um, pleased to welcome the Director, Frances Ash Goins, today, as, as well as her team. Now, better supporting women and girls so that fewer um, of them become infected with HIV and so that we better support um, women living with HIV is really a critical priority for the nation as well as this administration. Now, this year marks the sixth annual National Women and Girls HIV AIDS Awareness Day, and we're reminded that in the United States, women and girls account for about a quarter of the HIV epidemic. We've lost more than 90,000 um, women due to AIDS in the United States since, since the beginning. Now, thankfully, women and girls are at lower risk for HIV f infection than men, but that doesn't mean that we don't have to take seriously the, the need to respond to, to the epidemic facing women and girls, but also the unique factors of what are the issues that make them uniquely vulnerable to HIV and how do we address, address these issues in a, in a strategic way. Black women, as you may know in particular, are um, disproportionately um, affected um, throughout 15 times more likely to become infected with HIV than white women. Latinas, about nine times more likely. HIV infections were the leading causes of death among black women and Latinas in their prime of life, ages 25 to 44. Now, these are really shocking statistics, 15 times, nine times. So part of what I think we need to do is really come up with um, strategic responses about how we're going to seriously address the, these very large disparities. Now, today's meeting was convened to um, engage all of us in a meaningful conversation about HIV AIDS and its impact on women, young women, girls. The panels you'll hear from will cover a variety of topics, including prevention, access to care, and we have a panel on um, the role of social media in reaching women and girls. Now, as you may know, um, President Obama released the National HIV AIDS Strategy for the United States last July. And really everything that our office does, and real, we really think as an HIV community, everything we, we do now really needs to be focused on how do we um, implement um, the National HIV AIDS Strategy. And we hope that um, today's conversation will help us move on, on that path. Now, 
I could spend a long time talking about what's in the strategy. I'm not going to do that here, but there, I'm just going to highlight just a few key action steps in the strategy. It says we need to intensify HIV prevention efforts in communities where HIV is most heavily concentrated. We need to expand targeted efforts to prevent HIV infection using a combination of effective evidence-based approaches. We need to establish a seamless system to immediately link people to continuous and coordinated quality care when they're diagnosed with HIV. We need to support people living with HIV with co-occurring health conditions and those who have challenges in meeting their basic needs such as housing. And we need to reduce stigma and discrimination against people living with HIV. Success in doing any one of these will benefit women and girls. And also, there are unique issues affecting women and girls as we seek to address all of these areas. As just one example, we're very focused on coming up with the best evidence-based approaches to preventing HIV. And we believe that sort of a, a challenge right now is how do we put together various tools, whether it's HIV testing, risk reduction education, the various things we do recently, um, biomedical interventions, you know. Um, oral pills or microbicides, how do we put all these together in exciting ways to um, really have the best impact of preventing infections? And one of the things that we anticipate is the best combinations might vary. So what we would do for young Latino gay men might be very different than what we would do for older heterosexual black women. So for the next few years, we're really trying to say, you know, there's a lot of activity at CDC, NIH, HRSA, SAMHSA, the federal agencies, really trying to say, how can we come up with these best combinations of, of prevention? Now, the strategy also recognizes that many women's risk for HIV is in many cases driven by the risk behavior of their male partners, and that female-controlled technologies are important to stem infections among women. Now, I'm sure all of you or most of you are very well aware that there's been a lot of excitement in the last year about um, the using antiretroviral medications, whether it's as a microbicide or, again, as an oral pill, as a, a new prevention technology. I believe Dr. Brown is going to um, talk a little bit about this in more detail. But I also just want you to know that many people throughout HHS are really thinking right now, how do we take the next steps? You know, these were exciting findings, but there's still a lot we need to learn. But how do we move deliberately and aggressively to, to use these exciting findings and put them, um, put them into action? So in closing, I feel like we have a lot of momentum within the federal government and outside to really seize the moment that was created by um, the release of the National HIV AIDS strategy. I feel like we're doing our part at the federal level. I think you've probably seen more activity on HIV AIDS than perhaps ever before. And we're increasingly looking to leadership from other stakeholders because, you know, we have our role, but we can't do this alone. And so I really hope that today's meeting is a forum for sharing a lot of information, but also a lot of creativity. You know, so it's not just that we're all doing things, but are we doing the most strategic things possible? And so I'm really looking forward to this discussion. But again, as I said at the very beginning, we're very um, happy to be joined by one of our strongest champions. So now it's my pleasure to introduce Donna Christensen, who represents the United States Virgin Islands in the Congress. Good afternoon, everyone. And thank you, Jeff for your introduction and your, uh, the words that you shared with us as we began this program. And I want to thank your staff as well, especially James Albino and uh, Chantel Britton, and also to thank Frances Ash Goins and her staff at the Office of Women's Health, both of you for inviting me to be a part of the sixth annual National Women and Girls HIV Awareness Days program. And before I begin, I also want to thank and applaud Jeff for your leadership at the Office of National AIDS Policy, your vision and collaboration that has been nothing short of extraordinary. And I know that while this epidemic is so complex, I also know that the plan that you and your team have spearheaded and the coordination that's going ongoing between the different federal agencies will really pay, play a pivotal role in this nation's very significant steps that we're going to take forward towards the elimination of HIV and AIDS. So let's give Jeff and his team his office a big round of applause. And France, where's Francis? There you are. Oh, you're right in front. I remember you asking me some time ago about attending some event. It may have been this one. So I suspect you two have had played a role in the great honor I have of giving today's keynote. So thank you also for the great work that the Office of Women's Health has been doing and what you're going to be doing with the expanded role that you've gotten through the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act. We're also fortunate to have a really great group of panelists 
all of most of whom I've worked with either directly or indirectly over the years, and an outstanding audience too, of advocates, providers, researchers, caregivers, and women living with HIV and AIDS, all of whom are on the front lines every day. And it's fantastic to see so many young women in here with us this afternoon. It's also significant, really, that the, it is at the White House that this very special, wonderful, and powerful group is coming together to commemorate National Women and Girls HIV AIDS Awareness Day. And to join women around our country and our world to acknowledge the profound impact that this epidemic is having on women, to increase the awareness of the disease and its risks, as well as the importance of prevention and the methods of prevention, and to come together to determine what we can do and how we will take action. Yesterday, as in many other places, an agency called HOPE, an AIDS not-for-profit in my district, held a rally and health fair to commemorate this day. And most of the individuals that they've been testing lately have been women. The Virgin Islands, along with Maryland, Connecticut, New Jersey, and Delaware, are among the few jurisdictions where women make up a third of those who are infected and living with AIDS. It's not a distinction that any of us are really proud of. But the rest of the country is not far behind, and that's why this day is so important. Women have gone from representing 8% of AIDS diagnosis in 1985 to close to 26% in 2009. So ladies, we have our work cut out for us, and men, we expect you to be at our side. But we also know that women everywhere, with or without resources, always rise to the challenge. And so, we will, so will we. Because as women, we are mothers, grandmothers, spouses, and daughters, not only of our biologic mothers, but of our ideologic mothers, our political mothers, our activist moms. And that list is long, but there are women like Sojourner Truth, Eleanor Roosevelt, Mary McLeod Bethune, Dar Dr. Dorothy Height, Wilma Painkiller, Dr. Anthe Antonia Novella, Sandra Day O'Connor, Wangari Mathai, Elizabeth Glasler, Glazer, Patricia Niles, Jeannie White, and we have with us Hadia, Christina, and Regan. Not to leave out two of my CBC leaders, Maxine Waters and Barbara Lee. In my time in Congress, it was the Women's Caucus, at least a few years back, that really practiced bipartisanship, and we passed legislation together. I've seen the Democratic women of the House lead in times of crisis or fill the void when there were leadership voids in the Congress. We were, we were extremely proud to serve under the leadership of a speaker, Nancy Pelosi, who led one of the most productive Congresses in recent years. And Secretary Clinton continues to make us proud in this administration, where several departments, agencies, and offices are led, he, headed by women who lead with distinction and effectiveness. And of course, we have a First Lady who calls us not only to health and well wellness and to compassion, but also inspires our entire nation to greatness. In every time and every place, women have stepped forward to lead. Some we know well, but there have been and are now countless others whose names we will never know. We are in their debt, we stand on their shoulders, and we are emboldened and empowered by their sisterhood. We won't let them down. We will seize the opportunity of the National Strategy, the Affordable Care Act, the 2012 budget, and any other avenue that we can, and we will take action. This administration, as you've heard, has developed a strong national HIV and AIDS strategy. It's now in the implementation phase. Despite the recession, the President in his 2012 budget proposes to increase discretionary AIDS funding by $382 million with specific investments and reordered priorities to maximally lower the number of new HIV infections increase access to care for people living with HIV and AIDS, and to reduce HIV-related disparities. Although under severe threat today, that landmark Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act, through its prohibitions on exclusions for pre-existing disease, rescissions, and lifetime caps, through ending premium and other discrimination against women, 
as well as through the Medicaid expansion, the exchanges, the other consumer protections. All of them will bolster the ability of women and anyone who is HIV positive or who has AIDS to access quality medical care and to access it early as well as to have timely prevention services. So now the rest is up to us, as Jeff said. What can we do to take action? As I've already alluded to, protecting the gains we have made and will make in healthcare reform and protecting the President's budget, increasing it, of course, if we can, has to be part of the action that we all have to take. We're now around 30 years into this epidemic. Women make up a far larger percentage of persons with HIV and AIDS than at the beginning of it. As Michael Sidibe, the Executive Director of UNAIDS said, this epidemic, unfortunately, remains an epidemic of women. Worldwide, half, more than half of the 33.3 million adults living with HIV and AIDS are women. And as we said earlier, women are around 26% of infections in this country. But especially in African Americans and other people of color, the picture is worse and it has not been improving. The incidence rate among new infections, as Jeff said, among black women is almost 15 times that of white women and for Latinas, nine times more. Native American women also have a higher rate of AIDS diagnoses than our white or Asian counterparts, with Asians having the lowest. So no matter what advances have been or how much we now know, still in 2011, we have a monumental task ahead. And as the administration is urging us to do, we have to think out of the box. While what we have been doing has made an impact, we have to admit that and we have to celebrate it, it hasn't been enough. So I hope that among our young people who are with us today, they can infuse not only new energy, but also point us to some new ways forward. I think the scope of our efforts needs to be broader, especially in addressing this epidemic that has been with us for so, far too long. Our vision and thus where we take action has to encompass the broader aspects and the underpinnings of our health. We can't win this battle without addressing the social and economic determinants of health. The CDC and others have reported that poverty is the single most important demographic factor associated with HIV infection prevalence in inner city heterosexuals and that low income areas are where the generalized HIV epidemics are found in our country. We will not change the course of HIV and AIDS in this country, particularly in communities of color where the epicenter is, without addressing poverty and all that comes from it. I also think we have to change our approach. And while I don't really have any great ideas, they're going to come from all of you about what that approach ought to be. It's clear that to change the course of this disease, we have to go outside of the walls of our offices and often outside of our own comfort zones. Because if you can't reach those that we seek to help where they are, in their environments, addressing all of their concerns, of which HIV may be the least of them, we may not likely reach them at all. And we need to make sure that by how we structure our services and how we deliver our messages, we're not enabling discrimination or reinforcing stigma. Most importantly, we need to acknowledge that the experts in reaching the hard to reach are they themselves their community leaders, and the people who already have their trust. For the optimal effectiveness, the programs have to be community designed and driven. An important part of this is also having providers that come from the community or have the same background as the community that they're serving. The rest of us are there to be, as, to be consultants, technical experts, and we have to focus, as was the intention of the Minority AIDS Initiative, on building capacity in those communities if the investment that we're making is to bear any long-lasting fruit. So I can say without fear of contradiction that not any one of us in here want to be here 30 years from now commemorating this day. We don't want to be here 20 years from now, not even 10 years from now. So I hope that my ramblings today have reminded us all of the strong legacy that we've inherited from century, centuries of ordinary women and girls, because some of those leaders were teenagers. So from women, young and old, who have done extraordinary things and in doing so changed or improved the world for all of us. We are their daughters. They knew or came to know their power 
and we must know and use ours. One of their and our strengths as women is our creativity, a word that Jeff used earlier. We can make beautiful quilts out of rags. My mother used to tell me that she and her five brothers and sisters, had, when they had nothing else to eat, my grandmother would put together some soup that was called lap lali. It was essentially some kind of an onion soup, but that's all, if that's all they had, that's what they had for dinner. And I'm sure that every one of you could give me examples of making something extraordinary out of something that someone else would be throwing in the trash. And you could also tell me of ways that mothers and grandmothers fiercely protected and defended their families. Another is our inner strength, our resiliency, our ability when we don't think we have it in us to rise to meet any challenge. And we are nothing if not persistent. Those qualities are what we are going to bring to our effort to eliminate HIV and AIDS. That virus does not know who it's messing with. We're aware, we're committed, we are determined, and we will figure out just what it is that we have to do, and we will do it. We will take action. So thank you for inviting me. It's been truly an honor and a pleasure to be a part of this event. I have a fellow from my office, Waverly, Gordon with me today. And we're going to stay for the entire presentation. If you have any questions for me now, that's fine. But if you wish, we can wait until the general question and answer period as well. OK. They may we'll just participate in the general discussion, because I didn't you know, I was just trying to kind of frame a way to get us all energized and ready to go. Thank you all. Thank you, Congresswoman Christensen. Let's give the Congresswoman another round of applause. So we will now have Dr. Gina Brown from NIH give an epidemiological overview of HIV among women and girls in the United States. She joined NIH's Office of AIDS Research as a medical officer managing microbicides and women's and girls' research issues. She has worked with the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene and with Columbia University. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Brown. absolutely honored to be here and I just thank you for inviting me to I think it's a real opportunity for us to get lots of information from others I mean I think you'll hear from not just the biological and the epidemiological review that I'm going to give you but it'll be a real opportunity to see how this applies to what's being done on the ground so my charge today was to give you a bit of an epidemiologic background and what I'm actually going to do is I want to set a context and I want you to take some of this information back with you and talk to girls about it. Talk to girls about what HIV is, talk to girls about what the risks are, what their risks may be. And hope, and it's hard to do, especially when I'm saying talk to young girls about this. But hopefully, if we start to educate people and educate our young women, they'll have a better sense of their abilities to protect themselves. Next slide. So what I'm showing you here first is just to look at what the impact is of HIV internationally. Women, as was said earlier, women make up more than 50% of the epidemic. But I want to bring your eye to two things. One is you'll see globally where women are, with sub-Saharan African rates even higher. But that next line underneath is the Caribbean. And does anybody know what the air bridge is? The air bridge is this concept that women and men, people from the Caribbean, move quite fluidly back and forth, particularly along the East Coast. And so that some of those women that, are, that you see on that listing are also women who may have come in and out of the United States, who may have gotten their HIV in the United States and gone back to live in the Caribbean, who may have gotten in the Caribbean and come into the United States. But we need to understand that in a fairly short period of time from the epidemic, those rates rose absolutely rapidly. And we're talking about also in a place where you may not get testing done in the same way as it's done in New York State, which is where I've spent a lot of my career where all women who come to present for labor and delivery are offered HIV testing earlier in their pregnancy. Next slide. 
In the United States, you can look at how the epidemic has changed. And if you see the orange line, and it takes us back to the very early days in the 1980s when we first started to recognize HIV in women, women made, um, if you look to the right, it gives you the percent of the total, and on the left, it gives you the absolute numbers. Look how very rapidly that rate has risen and continues to rise. So women started out roughly by being about 8% of the epidemic. By the early to mid-90s, 93, 94, we were offering HIV testing, and it was to most women who were coming in for labor, who were coming in for prenatal care, women who were coming in for any kind of pregnancy prevention or, or reproductive health care were being offered HIV testing. And so it's not just about offering them the testing. We picked up a large number, but we're also continuing to see how those rates are rising over time. And so I think that's the take home message, which is women are one of the fastest rising rates of HIV infection over the years. Next. If you look at this list, when we talk about the risk, and one of the ways to look at the impact of HIV on a group or on a community is to look what's at what's called case rates. And so you're looking at the number of HIV diagnosed cases and you normalize it by looking at per 100,000 population of that group. When you break this down, you can see that black and African American women have a case rate that's much higher than any other group with the exception of black and African American men. So we're looking at the all female case rate is 11.5. If you go down the list, you can see where women lay out. Black and African American women, it's 56, meaning for every 100,000 black and African American women, there are who are tested within this 37 states that reported to CDC in 2008. There were 56 black and African American women who were HIV positive. If you go down the list, you can see how much higher that is than any of the other women's groups. If you look at all men, black and African American men have a much higher rate, but black and African American women are right behind them and higher than any other general male group. So women are a real issue for HIV disease in this country. If you're looking at the diagnoses in the US and US dependent areas, that'll include Puerto Rico, the Virgin Islands, Guam, you can see again how that lays out with black and African American women having much, much higher rates. Um, the lowest rates amongst Asian, people who call themselves multiracial, with white and Hispanic being roughly neck and neck. Next. And then if you're looking at what the related cause of HIV is, or what's the most likely risk factor, for women across the three major racial groups that have the greatest amount of HIV in women, it's clearly heterosexual contact. And the other thing you should understand is if you list that you're an intravenous drug user, that's going to trump the group that you end up in. So it may have been heterosexual contact, but if you're an, an intravenous drug user, it's going that risk factor is going to be what becomes your risk factor, whether or not you actually got it that way. So it may, in any case, what we can look at is you're still looking at more than three quarters of the way in which women get HIV is through heterosexual contact. So what I want us to understand when we walk out of here today is how women become infected, how women can prevent infection, and then how those two things intersect so we can start to think about some of the programs and projects that will let us really attack this and prevent this disease in women in a very organized and sensible way. Because it's really that intersection. It's not just the you know, how the virus got in, but it's very much about what they can do and what women can do to help prevent it in themselves. So what I'm going to talk to you about today are the, just, are the biological, and you're going to learn a little biology and a little anatomy. Um, some of you, I know there are some medical students in here, so you may know that biology and anatomy. We're going to talk a bit about the behavioral, sociocultural, the situational issues, and understand that all of these things on this list very much intertwine to increase women's risk. We've talked about race already, and socioeconomic status in this country is one of the biggest indicators of HIV risk, meaning being of low socioeconomic status. So in terms of anatomy, there are age-related issues. And what we're seeing for HIV is a couple of interesting things. Younger women, women of reproductive age group, and that's between the ages of 15 and, th and, and 44, are, make up the bulk. But one of the rapidly growing groups within women are women over the age of 50. And what we've learned over time, and I think we're very much at a tipping point on this, that there seems to be an understanding that there's a biology for this. It's not just sort of by chance or that we're starting to diagnose women, but there, what we've gotten a sense of as we learn more and more about women's risk, that there's a biology that talks about this. So in pre- or peri-adolescent age period, so you're talking about women under the age of 16, 15, 16, there are marked changes that happen in the vagina. Very young women, young girls, have a very smooth vagina, not very pliable, so that when they have sex, 
it's much more likely to tear, whether it's by force or whether it's by consent. So then, and much more likely to get microabrasions. So, so that is something that biologically can increase their risk. Within adolescence into adulthood, the vagina is really impacted by hormones at levels that are starting to rise. They start to menstruate. And the vagina develops these very nice folds called rugae. And that's part of how the vagina expands to let a, a fetus's head out at, in childbirth. As menopause comes along, as women become somewhat older, their hormone levels begin to drop. The vagina, again, becomes much less pliable, much smoother, a lot less um, giving. And so that when they have sex, they also are much greater risk of having vaginal either micro tears or larger tears. And again, it's a place where you can look and see what happens with them in terms of can increase risk. In addition, across these age ranges, we know, and there's some tremendous work that's being done, that if you go to the next slide, there's a wonderful immune function of the entire female genital tract, and that changes as women are either younger, middle of sort of reproductive age group, and as they get older. And all of those may impact your ability to get HIV infected or your risk. So we know that the normal vag vaginal environment is protective. You know, we think it's actually somewhat harder to get HIV than we may think, but there's something that happens and there's something that's happening that increases a woman's risk. If she has an infection, either a sexually transmitted disease or a yeast infection or a bacterial infection where yeast and bacteria kind of get out of balance, all of those increase her risk. If there are microabrasions from sex or from something like a herpes infection, that will increase her risk. There's some tremendous work that's being done that's looking at semen, where semen, where sperm, the fluid that sperm travels in, actually may lower the immune function of a woman's vaginal fluid. And the thought is, I mean, that's functional. If you want to get pregnant, you certainly don't want her to have an immune response to sperm. So it's functional to do that, but that's also a period of time or, or way in which you can lower a woman's immune function. And there may be other immune parameters that vary over time and with work done during pregnancy, an important issue because one of the higher risk factors for our current mother to child transmission is if a woman develops HIV during pregnancy, during the course of pregnancy, and has that high viral load, her risk of passing the virus on to her infant is much higher. The other thing is that when a woman stands up, which way does her vagina point? I know, I use this word a lot when I talk about this stuff. And I'm sure it horrifies some of you, but it's... Okay, the key is it doesn't point straight up and down. Can you go to the next slide? The next slide. And so when she's standing up, the top of her vagina is actually somewhat horizontal to the floor. Semen pools in the vagina, and so two or three days after someone has sex, and I'm doing a, a vaginal exam, I can put that fluid on a slide and see sperm. So she has a longer exposure, and I've, you know, I'm a gynecologist, we've done that, but she's a longer exposure to seminal fluid, which is what, where HIV travels, than a man whose exposure is simply penis in and penis out. The other things, it's unprotected sex. Not having sex that involves use of a condom, which is about all we have that's available. It's having sex with men who also have sex with women. And that's not something that women often may know, although some do, but it's a question that needs to be asked whether or not you get the honest answer. But it also means being able to protect yourself. It's anal sex, and I'll show you some data on that because people are starting to ask that question more and more. And it's when we talk about protection, we often talk about anal sex protection for men, but you also have to talk about it for women as well. And then vaginal practices. Women from my mom's generation were instructed to douche, and then they tried to make their daughters do the same thing. And you can go into CVS or Rite Aid or any of these places and find a whole row of many different kinds of products to put into your vagina to clean it out because it's dirty. But in fact, your body cleanses itself, and all of those things actually can change the pH balance, can change the normal bacteria that would live in your body that's considered to be healthy, and can put you at greater risk for HIV. And there's some tremendous work that's being done on the different vaginal practices around the world that can change and increase your risk for HIV. If you're paying attention to some of the, the news and the blogs, there's some data that's being done that's looking at lubricants, you know, the things that are the wonderful TV commercials where people are just having just wonderful times at 7.30 in the evening for your children to see. Um, but some of those lubricants have been sh shown to be either hyperosmotic, as in having too many kind of salt particles, so they take fluid out of the cells that are in your vagina, or hypoosmotic, where they 
don't have, a, they have more fluid than particles, and so they'll put water into the cells, and that can be damaging so that when you have sex with them, you can actually get some abrasion. And so that we don't, it's not great data yet, but people are starting to look more closely at what, what impact these factors can have. And then there's substance use. There are two ways to look at it. It's that if you're intoxicated or your partner's intoxicated, it's sure hard to bargain or to negotiate about safer sex. But there's also been some data that's looked at both uh, methadone, looked at heroin, and looked at cocaine, and thought that there may be some immune parameter changes for people who are using those kinds of drugs. And so they've not been able to relate it yet to actually increase HIV risk, but they're all sort of things that we need to consider and to think about. When you're talking about kind of sex act that people do, there are different risks assigned. So insertive oral, as in penis going into mouth, that's considered to be the least risky for the person with the penis. But if you look at the different kinds of risks that women may have, receptive oral has twice the risk. Receptive vaginal, 20 times the risk. And receptive anal sex is considered to be 100 times the risk of being an insertive oral partner. So the practices that you have, the, the sexual practices, can also increase your risk if they're done without protection. Um, the National Youth Risk Behavior Survey is a survey of, of, of young people that looks at many different things up to and including do they wear seat belts, but they also ask questions about sex. And so this data that was most recently reported by the Centers for Disease Control looked at condom use during last sex, and they broke it down by race and ethnicity. So you look and think, oh my goodness, 61% of kids having sex are using condoms. But I urge you to look at that at 39% aren't. 68.6% of males but only 53, almost 54% of females are, are had condom use at their last sexual encounter. And I think that's an important message to drive home, which is we may be getting better, but we're certainly not there yet, and there are a whole lot of kids who are at risk. And if they didn't use it at their last sexual encounter, and they ask that question specifically because people can't always remember, you know, over the last eight months how many times, it's you don't know how many times, it means that they're putting themselves at risk at least some of the time, if not all of the time. The other study that was done was looking at heterosexual anal intercourse. And it's something that people don't talk about, it's something they assume that women or women won't do. And they broke it down in terms of ever having anal intercourse, and you can see it's as high as 40 something, 42, 43% in Seattle to as low as, say, 31, 32% in St. Louis and New Orleans in that group. And understand that many people won't admit that they have it anyway, so it's probably higher numbers. And then with their last partner, if they've ever had anal sex, and you can see how the numbers. But I think the thing that drove, was driven home to me is the condom use for anal sex was only 36%. Males used it about 45%, and women only 26%. And if you work with teenagers, I can remember being um, I don't know, momentarily horrified talking to a young woman, 14, 15 year old girl, who talked about that being the choice because then you stay a virgin and you save vaginal sex for either your special partner or for the person you're going to marry or the person that you marry. And so, And there's been a lot more on blogs lately about the risk associated with anal sex with people asking the question, isn't it safer? And that's really kind of horrifying because it's not that it's safer, it's actually without a condom entirely more dangerous. And so it's a message that needs to get out there, and, and I think particularly among young people who may not see it as real sex. So we need biomedical prevention because most HIV is sexually transmitted, either for women or for men. Um, and the current methods that we have for women in particular are not something that women can control. So male condoms, clearly you've got to negotiate, you've got to get someone to, be, to agree to wear it. A female condom, yes, you can put it in, but it takes an awful lot of negotiation to use it properly. And I urge you, if you haven't seen one, to go online, Google it, and you'll see what I'm talking about. It fits in your vagina, lines the vagina, and there's a little ring that sits on the outside, and you've got to negotiate to get the person to put the penis inside the little ring as opposed to alongside. Not an easy thing to do unless you're truly committed to this, and not an easy thing to do if you're a fumbling teenager as well. The other thing is current prevention is contraceptive, and young women are, and women of reproductive age have to make the decision of, do I trust enough to have sex without a condom or without protection so that we can get pregnant? And even in this country, I think woman's currency is very much related to her ability to childbear. And at the moment, we have no non-condom pr protection for anal sex, for men or for women. So there have been a number of studies that have been done, and the, the most recent is um, the Caprice study, and it's been the most successful. And what it did was look at using 
tenofovir, which is an antiretroviral, in a gel form, and women used it within 12 hours before sex and within 12 hours after sex. So they used it twice. It's before and after, and it's called the BAT24 regimen, and no more than two times in 24 hours. And what they found, you can see in the lower box, is for women who use the gel compared to women who used a gel without the tenofovir in it, there was a 39% reduction in the HIV incidence, in the new infections in women who were using the tenofovir gel. If they were absolutely adherent, they used it correctly the way they were supposed to, more than 80% of their sexual encounters, it was 54%. So it actually can work quite well. And then the sidebar piece of data from that was, it also lowered herpes simplex virus infection rates 51%. And it's tremendous because herpes can actually be quite related to HIV risk as well. So I mean, that's a real step forward in prevention issues for women. Next. Most recently, we got some data on something called the IPREX study. Have you guys heard of it? It's IPREX, it's looking at PrEP, which is oral pre-exposure prophylaxis. So it's an oral prevention. So you take a pill by mouth every day, and when you have sex, it's thought that there'll be this antiretroviral in your system. So if the person has HIV, it'll prevent you from taking on the HIV, becoming infected, and then reproducing the HIV. So it's a once daily pill. And this study was done with men who have sex with men and transgender women who have sex with men. And it was part of a comprehensive package of HIV services, as was the other, in terms of prevention. There was a 44% reduction in people who used the, the oral tenofovir plus another drug called emtricitabine, and it's together called Truvada. And if people were more than 90% adherent, there was a 73% reduction. So we really have moved forward. We have a gel that can potentially reduce HIV infection rates in women, and we have a pill that's been shown to work in men. Next slide. But we still have, we still have a ways to go. So we have to, there needs to be some repetition of these studies to show that they actually work. So that there's confirmation studies that are now ongoing for microbicides. And people are starting to look at other formulations. So now it's a gel, but we're also starting to look, can you make it in a ring form that's like the contraceptive ring? Something you would put in and leave in for three months and then take it out, and it would work, and for those three months you'd be protected. A lot less fluid, um, a lot for many women, maybe easier to use. Vaginal film, it looks like a two by two, like a post-it note. You fold it in half and fold it in half again. Um, there's contraceptive film that does that, and the concept is you could probably impregnate that with a microbicide, put it in, it would work the same way. A lot less messy, easier to use, a lot less evident. We're also looking at rectal safety um, of the different kinds of microbicides to see if they are safe to use in the rectum. The current formulation for the vagina isn't safe to use, so they're looking at how can we formulate this so we can have one product that can be used in both places. There are also pregnancy studies because women who are pregnant may, may actually be at greater risk for HIV infection. Women have sex during pregnancy, and if they get infected during pregnancy, the risk of mother-to-child transmission is much greater. And then we're looking at other special populations in microbicides, and for once, men are the special population in this group. Um, adolescents, and then also looking at the safety and efficacy in, in menopausal women. The pre-exposure prophylaxis studies, there are studies that are going down now to confirm it, and to look at how you would implement this in populations, so giving men the pills to use and seeing what it takes to get them to do it and how you roll it out. There's PrEP in women studies that are going on, and then we're also looking at currently male circumcision studies prevent HIV heterosexual transmission in men, but they're also starting to look at what's the impact in women and what's the impact in MSM. Next. So, at NIH, we do this, try to do this in a very coordinated way. So we pull in the experts, both community experts and NIH experts, to talk about what are the priorities for research, and that's how the funding happens. And it's the annual trans-NIH plan for HIV AIDS related research. Next. Almost done. And what we hope to em eventually end up with is what's called the toolbox for prevention. Not all of these things are going to work 100%. You're going to have microbicides that work. We'll hopefully have a vaccine that works, PrEP, condoms behavior modification or behavior change that will get people to initiate sex at a later age, get people to have fewer sex partners, but also to use these kinds of prevention tools. Next. And if you want additional information, you can go to the OAR website and it can direct you to the many places you can go to get additional information. Thank you.
Thank you, Dr. Brown. There may be time um, later on to ask Dr. Brown some additional some questions if you have them. Um, but we're going to go ahead and get on to our panel discussions. Um, so we'll start with panel one, and panel one will explore effective strategies for prevention and will include insight and perspective on the facts, <coughs> risks, and real life experiences of those who have been affected by HIV AIDS. Our moderator for panel one is Janet Cleveland. Uh, Ms. Cleveland is the Deputy Director of Prevention Programs in the Division of HIV AIDS Prevention at the CDC. Uh, she also served in a number of state and local level public health positions including AIDS Project Director at Community Action Against Addiction in Cleveland, uh, a Health Educator and Disease Intervention Specialist with the Ohio State Department of Health, and a Public Health Project Manager with the Mississippi Safety Council in Jackson, Mississippi. So let's welcome Janet and Panel One members. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. It is truly a pleasure to be here today and an honor, and I want to thank the organizers for inviting me to moderate this important discussion this afternoon. We know, based on the information that we've already heard, that um, HIV continues to exact a devastating toll on, on women and, and, and girls in this country and around the world and particularly among women of color. So therefore, prevention is as essential and crucial as it has ever been in this country as we talk about moving forward in terms of how to reduce HIV infections in this country. Today we're going to hear from a panel of women leaders who will share with us their thoughts about HIV prevention and the needs of women and girls, and also strategies for addressing HIV infection in their communities. We're going to hear from uh, A. Tony Young, who is the founder and executive director of Community Education Group. A. Tony Young has served as the executive director since the organization's inception in 1993. Tony has been committed to HIV on the local, regional, and national level for more than 20 years, developing solutions to work to ensure community and government work in partnership to meet the needs of people living with HIV and AIDS in the United States. Christina Pena is ambassador for the Elizabeth Glazer Pediatric AIDS Foundation. Christina has been a youth ambassador for the Elizabeth Glazer Pediatric AIDS Foundation for over a decade and regularly speaks at universities, community forums, and fundraising events on a wide range of topics specific to the disease. Christina uh, Christina's area of focus, excuse me, largely centers on pediatric HIV and AIDS, transitioning youth, mother to child HIV AIDS transmission, education and prevention. And lastly, but certainly not least, Ms. Barbara Joseph, who is the founder and executive director of Positive Efforts, Inc. in Houston, Texas. Ms. Barbara Joseph is a heterosexual female who was diagnosed with uh, HIV 27 years ago from a blood transfusion after major surgery. Having run into many obstacles trying to receive medication, insurance, and other health services, frustration led to creative thinking. Thus, Positive Efforts, Inc. was born in 1999. Ms. Joseph has been on the forefront for over two decades, educating, testing, providing services, and comfort comforting those who are infected and or affected by the HIV and AIDS virus, and speaking out about the difficulties that face many within our communities. So this is our panel of leaders uh, for today in terms of our prevention discussion. And I'm going to begin the conversation by asking these leaders to so please tell us some of your thoughts about HIV uh, prevention for women and girls today in the United States and what you and your organizations are doing to make a difference in terms of the epidemic. Don't make me do this first. How about that? <laughs> um, one of the things that my organization does in Houston, Texas is uh, focuses on, my emphasis is on women. When I was diagnosed some 27 years ago, um, there were no services for women. There was n no conversation about certainly a, a heterosexual woman being infected at all. So f with that in mind, I ran into all kinds of things, and the only people that helped me in those days was the gay community, the gay white men. Uh, they said, this is going to happen to your community as well. Certainly I didn't think that then. I thought I was the only person in the world that was black. Um, 
uh, and, and had a disease that I didn't know where I got it from. It took six months for him to figure out that I had got it from the blood transfusion. And certainly I had signed all the papers, so of course, no, I did not. Uh, was able to sue anyone. <laughs> but I ran into all the problems, and I'm not sure if we are at a place where I can say that those problems are not still existing in our communities. Um, I do a whole lot of women, uh, a whole lot of education for women, and I continue to hear the same, some of the same stories that I heard um, 20 years ago, y'all. So, mm -hmm. There's a whole lot that needs to be done uh, as far as prevention and women and their concerns. Mm -hmm. So just to um, <clears throat> briefly, I was born HIV positive and I've transitioned from pediatrics to adolescence and now at 26 I'm in my adulthood, um, which is wonderful. So much of my experience stems with the pediatric and transitioning youth community. And I really want to address two important points. Um, regarding prevention. One, a component that I feel is lacking um, with regards to prevention efforts is support and services geared towards disclosure. And I don't want to um, confuse or I want to preface it that it's, I'm not talking about um, HIV criminalization or prosecution, but rather services that allow individuals who are HIV positive, both male and female, at different, whatever age you're at, um, where you need to disclose your status or the concern for being um, infected with other um, STIs, we need those disclosure talking points and we need the services to provide that. I do a lot of mentorship uh, for youth that are transitioning both pediatric and behavioral youth and that's something that comes up time and time again. How do you disclose to your partner? I speak louder. Okay, so how, I can speak a lot louder. <laughs> How to disclose to your partner, and this is something that I think is fundamental for prevention efforts. Another quick point um, that I'd like to stress is that we have the capabilities to eradicate pediatric HIV AIDS. We know we can do it, we can reduce the risk from mother to child, less than 2%. This is huge. Again, when I was born in 1984, my mom was entirely unaware that she was infected, had no knowing that she had passed it um, to me, but the reality that we can and pediatric HIV and AIDS in this country is paramount. However, still today, roughly 200 children are born HIV positive. So that's something in regards to prevention, we, we know how to do this for this category of women, women who are pregnant. Um, so we need to just push additional efforts to ensure that all pregnant women receive the accurate information when they're going through their care and are offered HIV testing in a holistic way that will entice them to want to do it and not push it away. Thank you. So what we do at Community Education Group, number one, we were originally founded as the National Women in HIV AIDS Project. Uh, we changed our name in 1996 because, uh, frankly, it was very difficult to raise money for women in HIV AIDS issues. Some of you I have known for a very long time and know exactly what I'm talking about. Um, so now we are actually kind of a hybrid. On the local community here in D.C. in Ward 7 and 8, we do approximately 10,000 HIV tests a year. Uh, we target high-risk heterosexual African Americans. What we find is a positivity rate somewhere between 2.8 and 3.1 percent. But the thing that I'm, I'm probably the proudest of is that we have a 98 percent linkage to care rate. And I think that that's one of the big things that we have to do is to, to make sure that we understand the importance of getting an individual to a medical home as a part of prevention, whether that's prevention for HIV, substance abuse, or finding a primary medical home for an individual with some other health disparity. I think one of the, the important things that I think where we are, I, I frequently get very, I hate my little six-year-old nephew says full up. I get very full up when I think about where we are uh, where, with HIV right now. I, I like to think of it as almost the, the perfect storm. Jeff talked about the national AIDS strategy. Uh, I think that that gives us a unique opportunity to rethink how we do HIV in the United States of America. I think that we have an emphasis on HIV for one of the first times that I can really remember on a domestic epidemic. I think that we have a unique opportunity with the E-CHIP strategy that's coming, which will roll out at some point to be the 12 city strategy. I think that one of the next pieces that we have coming in the United States, and I, and I have to thank the president, you know, he calls me frequently, 
and about this <laughs> is to say, you know, lifting the ban. Because, you know, one person that's here that a lot of you may not know is Tiffany Chester. Tiffany, raise your hand. Stand up and raise your hand, please. I mean, because this is significant. And if you look at Tiffany, what you will notice is, is that she's not white, gay man who's organizing the International AIDS Conference for 2012. That's a big deal. So when we talk about kind of where we are with understanding and awareness of African American women, African Americans in the, in the disease area of HIV, I mean, that's very, very important. That's very, very heavy and weighted. And so I think it's important to us as far as prevention to go is to take action on the local level with policy, take local action on the service provision, take local action in government. But I think that we have to take action in very proactive ways and become effective partners with our government partners. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Thank you. I was thinking back to uh, Dr. Brown's uh, presentation, and, and she just so beautifully laid out for us how important um, the issue of biology and anatomy of women's bodies, um, how important those things are as we think about HIV prevention. And so now what I would like to ask you ladies is what messages and strategies do you think are most effective uh, when conveying the importance of uh, prevention to women that you work with? And I'm also particularly interested in um, what messages do you think are effective in terms of getting women tested for HIV? We've had a huge scale up here in the United States of uh, not only HIV testing, but also helping to ensure that those women and, and others are, are linked to care. So what are your thoughts about that particular issue? And why don't we start with, we'll start with Christina this yeah, time. Good girl. <laughs> Great. I'll speak up a little louder. Sorry about that. Um, one category of education and, and getting these um, concerns across to our young people, I think we need to remember sex education right now is outdated in our school system. We have our students coming through public and private schools that um, do not have the knowledge or the updated information to navigate through their sex lives. So that's something that's extremely important and crucial. And we know where our students are. We know where our kids are. So what we need to do, and I, I think this is something that would be from the ground level up, the local communities that focus on the HIV population needs to partner with the school districts. And this is going to take a lot of work, and this isn't going to be overnight. But we do need to go in there and partner with our immediate local areas and get into the school districts that serve our students and go in there and educate. We can't rely on the teachers to do it. Many teachers are uncomfortable. They don't have a holistic approach to sex education. So as community activists and leaders who are familiar with the disease and familiar with um, the threat level, we need to go in there and partner with our school districts. So that's something I would really emphasize with prevention efforts. And I really want to stress it needs to be a holistic approach to sex education. So we need to talk to both our, our girls and our boys and our co-ed and the mix and all of it, the whole gamut, about navigating through disclosure and communication and when to choose sex and what to do with sex and how to go get health care, where the local clinics are within their area, which ones are youth friendly, what their hours are. These are things that I think would be um, really important to our students. And I know our students, they're smarter than they think. <coughs> our young people are smart. So um, they're going to be hungry for that information. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Great. Tony? I think one of the first things we do is that we have to teach young women and girls the, the, the idea or the concept of, of self-compassion. Um, because they think that they frequently give one, one another and themselves very negative message, both about mm -hmm. sex, about sexual orientation, about sexual identity. Um, and I think that's the first part of what we have to do, is to have them be okay with who they are. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's one of the greatest challenges that we face as girls and as women. I think the next piece of that is really to be able to have a conversation about gender in a context that is very male identified. Whether we like it, agree with it, HIV is a very male identified health area. And so how do we begin to talk about gender in a flowing context? Mm -hmm. But I think as, as far as HIV prevention, counseling, and testing uh, specifically, I think that we have to be very committed to go out to the street where people are and not sit behind our desk and, and wait for individuals to come in to get screened for HIV, wait for them to get screened to be linked to some other sort of preventative medical care option. Mm -hmm. We can't afford to do that anymore because what we know is that people are unlikely to do that. So if we are truly into the area of prevention, we have to be willing to go get an individual and guide them to a medical home. And I, I, have to, um, 
I have to agree with that because what I'm finding in my community is that uh, women want to know but they don't know. The teachers are coming to us and saying to us, we can't teach in HIV uh, or anything about sexually transmitted diseases. The nurses in the schools don't have the knowledge that we, some of us that are providers, hell, we can uh, expand on it much better than they can. They're not comfortable with it. Uh, the teachers that I know of are having a hard time trying to explain to these young people uh, that what their risk levels are. Many of them don't think they're at risk at all. Many of them tell us right off, uh, they have no fear of HIV. They have more fear of getting shot by a drive-by or they have more fear of uh, not being able to find a job or, or a roof over their head. So HIV is low on their uh, mindset and, on, and so what we need to do as women uh, is to focus on what's going to make this woman feel better about herself. What's going to give her more self-worth? Maybe if she felt better about herself, get the education she needs, then she can negotiate condom use and, and practices. Uh, but until we start on the ground level, everything we're doing on the top level is, is um, it's not really going to work like we want it to. We have to start where we used to be uh, in the early days, one-on-one, -on -one, meeting people where they are, catching them by the hand, crying with them if that's what it takes in many cases because that's what, that's what people did with me. And so if I look at those things, I think that what we need to do as all women is collaboratively come together and partner and say enough is enough and we've done this long enough uh, one way, let's try and, and do it another way and see if that won't work. Yeah, you know, in talking about uh, efforts at the local level, you actually offer a, a, a great segue to the next question that I want to ask you. We've, we've heard a lot today about the National HIV and AIDS Strategy, and uh, I know at the Centers for Disease Control, we have uh, uh, fully taken on the charge of uh, trying to do things differently and working with our partners in terms of not only other federal partners and our sister agencies within uh, the Department of Health and Human Services, but also uh, partners from, from a variety of uh, uh, areas in terms of how are we going to move the needle mm -hmm. so that we're doing a better job of prevention um, in this country. Barbara talked about local level uh, efforts and I'm wondering how is the National HIV and AIDS strategy specifically impacting your work with the communities that you serve? How is, how is this uh, work around the strategy trickling down at this point? Let me, let me be clear. It hasn't trickled down yet. Okay. Sorry, Jeff. <laughs> it hasn't trickled down yet. Some of the stuff that the HIV uh, uh, stra national strategy states is that we need to decrease the infections, and, and we've been doing that. It's not nothing new. We've been going out there and hitting the grounds for years uh, and trying to uh, encompass all of these things. We talk to the store owners and partner with the community leaders, but a lot of them are not willing still to talk about HIV. I still have problems in the community that's all African American targeted area to put a sign up in, in a window of a store. They, they don't want to be associated. They're not ready to discuss it. So yes, the natural, we are so glad to have the national strategy, but at the same time, there's got to be more that we have to do and more partners that's willing to work with us to address all of these issues, and they are many. Okay. So first, I, I do want to say that having the National HIV AIDS Strategy, and this is pulled from the strategy itself, it is a roadmap to move the nation forward, and at least it gets us talking about this. It's great that we're here today mm -hmm. focusing on women and girls' issues, and I think that having the dialogue and the conversation is what is, is so important and imperative to combating this disease. Um, in regards to the strategy, um, I know it's gonna take some time to move things into order and I'm really excited to see it, it develop. But something that I really wanna emphasize that was nice, um, in 2009, December 2009, ONAP held a youth meeting here at the White House to focus on adolescent and youth issues. And this was imperative for this particular population because it was the first time we were actually, or that I can remember being part of the HIV community, recognized as being <coughs> adolescent and transitioning youth. And I wanna really emphasize transitioning youth because 
from, and that can be from 14 to 29, I believe is the age of 29, it's getting up there. I thought I transitioned out a while ago, but <laughs> I was kicked out at 21 for my pediatric care. No, but um, in terms of transitioning youth, I think it's really imperative that ONAP and the White House, that they're aware that this population exists. And it's, it's really important for the HIV community to also be aware of it, because this is something that's new. I'm part of the early generation who has been fortunate to transition. And this is something, the issues that we're experiencing with access to care, um, with going out and, and finding jobs, with going to college, with managing relationships, with managing long-term health. Um, again, when you have a, a transitioning youth, um, sometimes they've been on their medication for years, or you have individuals who are brand new in the system and have just become diagnosed, so they have to navigate it. So there's a lot of compl complexities with this population, but I really want to um, really thank ONAP for giving some recognition to this age group and having that included when considering the National HIV AIDS Strategy and moving forward. Okay, tell me. Okay, I completely drank the Kool-Aid. <laughs> um, I am all about the National Age Strategy. I am all about Egypt. I am all about the 12 cities. And here's how it is on the ground for me. And I, and I can only talk about our organizational experience and, and my experience, is that it has given us, yes, definitely a roadmap. But I think organizationally, it's given us targets. Mm -hmm. It's given us targets all the way to 20. 14. It's actually not just the National Age Strategy, it's also looking at the Affordable Care Act and saying that we have to completely rethink how we work. Mm -hmm. We have to rethink how we work in HIV. Mm -hmm. I have to rethink kind of working in my silo and saying all we do is HIV testing. I mean, we now are having conversations with Department of Employment Services, Department of Justice, Department of Labor. Why? Because we have a jobs program. Why? Because we're doing bridging to individuals to primary care that's not HIV related. And I think without a doubt, the National AIDS Strategy gives us that roadmap and should give each of, us, each of us that roadmap in our local communities and in our local organizations. I don't think it's the panacea, but I think that the implementation plans that are up online now will tell you where the federal agencies are going to go with, in relation to HIV. I think they're worth a read. There's some of them are kind of dry, but some of them are kind of good. They kind of tell you what the goals and objectives of HRSA and CDC and everybody else are going to be. So they tell me what I need to do in the next three years. Uh, how does it impact me also is that what I also know is the Kool-Aid that I drink, I'm one of the few people that drank it. So I have to really kind of explain to other people what impact this is going to have. How do I, again, engage new communities in understanding that this piece of policy may not impact you today, but it will in a year or in two years, and you should get on the board now. <coughs> Okay, great. Thank you all. Do we have time for one more question? Okay. We can do a couple more and question and answer? No? Okay. So uh, one more. <laughs> We've got so much to learn from you ladies, so thank you for, for uh, sharing. So I, I guess what we will end with then is, you know, your final thoughts in terms of this and we'll have time for uh, Q&A. But what is the best advice do you think that you could provide the people that are sitting in this audience today? Um, about HIV prevention for women and girls specifically, what would you want to leave this audience with in terms of your messages? And um, let's see, Barbara, should okay. we start with you? I think that one of the messages I'd like to see uh, us leave with is being open, open communication, being able to discuss this uh, in dialogue forms if necessary or one-on-one -on -one or whatever, but get people, get women and young girls to test early and find out their status. Uh, teach them how to negotiate with their partners and uh, to use the, the, the protections of the barriers that we have out there. Uh, don't be afraid. I want our women to start teaching our young women earlier and not waiting until they get into trouble mm -hmm. before we say anything to them. Many mothers are not willing to talk to their daughters. Uh, their young uh, ladies because they're just not comfortable with it. So I think that one of the things that I'd like to see is that all of us get involved and all of us start at a very early age to, to putting this in their heads and maybe, maybe we will, um, we will win this one. I think we can. Yeah, very similar um, 
what I'd like to leave the audience with is also, you know, to women and girls, and this is something that we can do all in this room, um, we just need to provide our, our women in, in our lives and the girls in our lives and the teenagers with the confidence to navigate their sex experience. Um, the communication skills, the education, and more, again, more importantly, that confidence. That's something that we see lacking. I know um, Dr. Brown had mentioned that when she was up. We really need to give our, our young women and children um, the skills to help define and, more importantly, guide their own sexual experiences. And then we need to have those conversations as mothers, as grandparents, as daughters, um, as teachers, as community leaders, as the strong women that we are in this room today, we need to go and move our, the next generation, the generation that we're a part of, um, to support this kind of dialogue. I mean, I think Barbara and Christina really laid it out, and you've laid it out, Gina's laid it out, Jeff's la laid it out, Representative Christensen's laid it out. We need to take action. Yeah. I think it's time for us to really re-up and recommit to kind of fighting this epidemic right here at home. This is not just about it being an international epidemic. We have challenges here that are built in some systemic issues, race, class, poverty, and gender. That means that we have to do double duty on the level of work we have to do, but it doesn't mean don't do it. It means that it's really an important time and I believe a critical time in us taking action to get people where we want them to be, particularly given where we're going to be in 2014. HIV will no longer be in the silo that it's been in. And so we have to figure out ways that we're going to impart new prevention and health messages to communities that need them the most. Great. Well, thank you to all of you uh, for not only uh, your thoughts that you've shared with us today, but for uh, your collective leadership in terms of HIV prevention. As we've clearly heard, the time is now. The time to take action is now, and you are certainly uh, demonstrating uh, that by your leadership and in terms of your actions, in terms of, of trying to make a difference in terms of uh, women's health and, and HIV prevention. I also want to uh, pay special acknowledgement and say a special thank you to the women who are living uh, with this disease, not only on this panel, but for women in this room who may be living with the disease. Even in 2011, it is not an easy thing to be able to get up and disclose one's status and to, and to tell a personal story about living with HIV disease in this country because it still continues to be a huge challenge. So I thank you not only for your commitment, but I thank you for your courage and I thank you for what you do every day. So let's give them a hand. So now we'll take a few minutes for Q&A. If anyone has any, Ooh. wow, wonderful. <laughs> so um, why don't we start up front and we'll try to get around this as quickly as we can. So the young lady with the red sweater. Okay, my name is Amber, I'm a student at American University. Um, I'm guessing Ms. Young or Ms. Joseph would better be able to answer this question. But have you had any success with uh, collaborating with the religious communities uh, in, in the black communities in prevention and reducing stigma because based upon some research I've done this seems to be one of the biggest barriers and reasons why HIV is more concentrated in the rural south. Uh, I'll, um, I'll attempt to hit it. Um, I was invited to the first African-American conclave that was held in uh, New York. Yeah which was very interesting, all of the top 150 biggest uh, African-American ministers were there. Mm -hmm. And I was amazed that they knew as little as they did five years ago about it. Some um, 15 years ago when I went into the first church trying to get the ministers to hear us, they told us that only those people that deserved it got it, got to this, this disease. So you know that didn't make me feel very well. And my political correctness went out the door at that time. <laughs> and I've never got politically correct since then. <laughs> Certainly the churches and the ministers are trying to work with us a little bit better than they did in the early days. Uh, we have seen some, uh, some ministers that's just, uh, I'm not sure if they're all coming over across the pulpit with it. But they are allowing us to come in and give uh, light messages in the churches. Uh, no condom, I'm still not being able to pass out condoms in there, 
but certainly I tell them to come to the car and we're going to give them to you anyway. Um, the, the, the young people are, are in the churches are desperate to get the information. They want to do it. But as long as we have, I think the preacher's wives are the ones that understand better than the ministers themselves. So that was my experience. Okay, all right. May we have someone from the back? Yes. Um, I'm sorry, I was actually looking at the woman with the uh, white uh -huh, scarf on. <laughs> Hi, my name's Lauren. I'm from HHS Office of HIV AIDS Policy, and I just wanted to bring up two of our more elusive targets of low perceived risk and stigma. Um, and Dr. Brown, I think you actually brought this up in your presentation when um, some of the risk behaviors that we talk about, folks just don't identify with. If they think that they're not having real sex, um, then they sort of walk right by our messages. And how do we sort of, uh, Put, position this so that everyone sees that this touches you as well. Um, and regarding low perceived risk, for a lot of folks, they're not engaging in a lot of things that we're calling risk behaviors and looking at some of those structural factors uh, that create and maintain health disparities. Mm -hmm. would be great. Thank you. Okay. Do we have time for more questions? Okay, one more. So, and I saw your hand go up most immediately. <laughs> Thank you. Hi there, I'm Abby Charles with the Women's Collective. We're based here in Washington, D.C. And nationally, we've seen a lot of you know, fears of funding cuts for reproductive health programs, but also with the medicalization of HIV and the move towards testing in a lot of emergency rooms and medical centers, we've seen funding for our prevention programs on the ground cut. So as the women's organization in D.C., my question is how do we expand to get to those people who are low risk identified and not just the high risk people who fit into our um, interventions such as CELE or SISTA. How do we get to those low risk people with messages to get them to test with decreased funding? You know, I, as I said earlier, I think it's about being very strategic. I mean, it's a strategy. It's a national aid strategy. And I think it teaches us to be very strategic. We have the Affordable uh, Care Act coming in. Uh, it's here, but we have most of it being implemented in 2014. I think that if you look at the national aid strategy, you look at the Affordable Care Act, you look at where funding is, both at the federal level as well as the local level, particularly here in D.C., I think it tells us very strategically we have to think beyond where we've been historically. I think that we can't look at individuals as high or low risk. I think that we have to look at those structural factors. We have to look at race, class, gender, poverty, and say, what are those people going to need as a portfolio for prevention? And in order to get them a portfolio of services per, for prevention, we may need to move outside of HIV-specific services. Mm -hmm. We may need to broaden what it is that we offer. We may need to offer them a cadre of services, which we've not historically done. We may, to, we may need to enter into new agreements and new partnerships mm -hmm. that we have not historically done, both with our local government, with our local health departments, as well as with other providers. Uh, we've entered into agreements with organizations and hospitals I never thought would see us as one of their primary partners, but they now do. And again, that's because we've all got one goal in common. How do we deliver effective prevention and care treatment and services in the district? And they use the media. Great. So I'm sorry, I've been told that we have to stop with the questions and answers, but I believe that all of the panelists, to include myself, will be here throughout the duration of the program and look forward to maybe having some conversation at the conclusion. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so we want to give our, our panel one a round of applause once again. Thank you guys so much. So Tony made reference to our Federal Operation Plan Overview Report, and I just want to throw a plug in that we do actually have the Operational Plan Overview Reports outside of this room, so if you want to pick up a copy, if you haven't seen it yet, they're available outside. Um, so we're going to move on to our next panel. Um, our next panel will explore the barriers that women, young women, and girls face in obtaining critical services and supports. The panel is also designed to address disparities that 
that positive women face, particularly with respect to health outcomes. The moderator for this panel is Frances Ash Goins, and Frances currently serves as the acting director for HHS's Office of Women's Health. In this capacity, she oversees numerous programs related to women's health issues, and throughout her years of service, she has implemented several innovative programs and national summits to address HIV AIDS, violence against women, and the Lupus Educational Awareness Project. Let's welcome Frances and our panel two participants. Thank you. As our panelists come forward, this session will explore the barriers that women, young women, and girls face in obtaining critical services and supports. This panel is also designed to address the disparities that positive women face, particularly with respect to health outcomes. I will be asking our panelists three questions and uh, we will get a response for them. But first of all, let me introduce you to our panelists. First, we have a long time person, one of the very first um, physicians that I knew working with positive women, Dr. Madge, Madge Coleman. She is a professor of medicine at Rush University. She graduated from Rush Medical College in 1976, completed her internal medicine residency and chief residency at Cook County Hospital, where I knew her from. And she worked at Cook County for more than 30 years, the length of the epidemic, and has a long history of care and advocacy to improve women's health and reduce health disparities. Our second panelist is Heather Hawk. She is the director of the Maryland Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, Infectious Disease and Environmental Health Administration. She served as chair of the National Alliance of State and Territorial AIDS Directors and has membership of national organizations since, 19, since 2003. She serves on NASDAQ's Executive Committee, Membership Committee, and the NASDAQ Global Program Ethiopia team. Prior to joining the Maryland Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, she was an independent consultant providing technical assistance to hospitals, national organizations, state public health agencies on HIV program development. Our third panelist is Hydea Charles. She is a graduate fellow at Suffolk University Health Wellness Services Office. Though she has an overall interest in health and wellness, she is especially interested in sexual and reproductive health and HIV. She has over 10 years of experience working with people infected and affected by HIV AIDS. As an advocate and grassroots activist, she has worked closely and committed personally to fighting the injustices faced by women across this country, particularly women living with HIV AIDS, their families, and their communities. It is thrilling that I have these panelists with me in my 40 years as a nurse, and I'm excited that to hear their responses to these very pivotal questions about health care for women with HIV AIDS. The first question is around general access to care. What are the main reasons that prevent HIV positive women from accessing HIV care? Uh, it's on. Thank as you. Long as it Thanks a lot, Francis. Um, well, I think one of the key issues is systemic issues related to our healthcare system. And um, though we look forward to changes in the next few years, I, I must say um, the sort of dysfunctional fragmented care system we have could be greatly improved with a universal single payer government sponsored universal access to care and we're not gonna get that right away. So with that in mind, I think what that would do really is, is provide an opportunity for everyone, everyone in, nobody out, to get the care that, that, that women with HIV are, are desperate to have. Um, 
certainly poor and women of color who bear the greatest burden of the disease don't have that access right now, um, and, and, and that would improve it. But I think there are a lot of other very specific issues as a provider that I see um, related to women's lack of access to care. And specifically, um, poverty is over, overarching sort of um, difficulty, from transportation to care to being able to provide daycare while you have to go to the doctor to missing work, et cetera. Um, domestic violence, a major issue for women with HIV. Studies that I've been involved in have found that over 60% of women with HIV have a history of, um, uh, of abuse, lifetime history of abuse, and that is very problematic for continuing access to care related to the self-efficacy that I think was discussed in the previous panel. Um, drug use does put people sort of not interested in sort of doing what's right in terms of their health care on, on a daily basis. And of course, distrust of our health care system um, uh, and providers is, is, is a big problem that I think women with HIV face. Finally, poor support systems in the community and families sometimes also make it very difficult. The experience I have with, with women with HIV is that depression is a key issue. Again, we found that over 60% of the women in our studies are, have clinical symptoms of depression, and that really prevents them from accessing and understanding what has to be done to move forward. Housing instability and competing issues of survival make it very hard. And finally, um, I think lack of disclosure, big, big issue, you brought it up, continues to be major. Um, and then the only other thing that I think, you've all mentioned all of that before, but issues of prison also are an access difficulty, either getting in prison or getting out of prison. Both of those places somehow prevent people from getting good care. Great, thank you. Um, at the state health department and in local health departments, we spend a lot of time with our community planning processes and our community planning groups asking exactly this question. What are the barriers uh, to access? What are the barriers to access to prevention services and to care services? Uh, the first step always is that in order for women to access care, they first have to know that they're HIV positive. So the first place to start always is to make sure that women are getting tested. And then I think uh, Marge's uh, list of all of those issues ring true from our understanding in Maryland from talking with consumers about access issues. I would just add two to the list, uh, transportation, the f literal inability to get there um, is another uh, big one always on the list. Um, and then uh, of course uh, the issue around stigma as a, as a general issue. I think the other thing that uh, we are spending a lot of time in Maryland talking about within the context of healthcare reform is the fact that we don't really have a culture of care in our country. We have a culture where we go to the doctor when we're sick, but we don't go for sort of well baby checkups. Um, and I think we really need to move in the direction where women um, and girls are accessing health care proactively uh, rather than waiting for there to be an issue, especially women who are positive but may not yet feel sick are certainly busy with all of the other life issues. And so uh, getting to the point where you go for the well baby visits and you go for the proactive uh, health care visits I think would go a long way with changing the access to care issues. Thank you. Uh, I wanted to thank the uh, Office of National Age Policy and the Office of Women's and Health for inviting me to be on this panel. Um, in thinking about ways to uh, improve access to care for HIV positive women, I think what comes to mind for me is the lack of um, comprehensive services available in certain facilities. Um, when I worked with positive women, it was especially hard for me to get them to some of our programming because they spent most of their days running to the doctor here uptown or going to the GYN person in Brooklyn. It was, it, was, it was not set up in a way where they could go to one facility and get their dental care, their GYN care. And then there's always the issue of child care. And uh, Dr. Cohen mentioned it as well that we have to be cognizant of all the other issues that are going on in, in women's lives, that HIV may not be a priority at all. Um, they're thinking about how they're gonna pay their bills. And so if and when we do get them into care, we have to facilitate that process so that they're able to see myriad of doctors um, so that they can uh, you know, keep themselves well. So I think uh, that's, that's something that we should definitely um, look into. Another thing would be even the attitudes of healthcare providers. Um, sometimes there's stigma when you go to get care and, and that can be very detrimental to people, especially 
for women who are newly diagnosed. Um, some women are not comfortable sharing that information with anyone, and so there's no support at all. And so once they go into these healthcare settings, if, if their attitudes are not of, of the providers are not such that are welcoming and inviting, that can also be a barrier to access to care. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think those are two that were not yet mentioned um, that we also need to be cognizant of. Thank you. Now, navigating the healthcare system can be quite difficult. It's important that we understand the process of navigating healthcare. And it can be overwhelming for someone that's dealing with such a highly controversial disease. What have you found to be the greatest barrier to finding adequate health care resources for women? And then how can we better integrate HIV testing, as was posed in the last panel, and other preventive interventions into the clinical setting? Okay, either, either one of you can start. Um, navigating the healthcare system can be a, a, a monumental task for anybody. And I think one of the ways that uh, we've uh, worked with that in New York is to implement uh, peer-based programming. And so once people are diagnosed as positive, um, there usually is a component uh, where they're linked to a peer educator or um, a case manager of sorts. And when there's a case manager, that person can really kind of help to, to navigate the different systems, um, especially in thinking about giving comprehensive care to people, which for me includes housing. Um, case managers help with that as well. And so if there's a, a, an area um, within the, the process of testing, getting your diagnosis, if it's positive, then linking uh, the women to a peer based type of support system, that also helps too. Um, I think as Tony alluded to, we have a little bit of a perfect storm um, with some opportunities that are on the table to increase our capacity and our ability to uh, better navigate, or client's uh, ability to better navigate the system. I think we have a lot of opportunities with health information technology uh, initiatives that are happening, uh, mm -hmm. both at the national level and at the local level. I know many states are, uh, especially Maryland, is significantly involved in the patient-centered medical home models uh, opportunities that we have, and I, and I think you know that certainly is critical when you're talking about the one-stop shopping type of models. Um, I think many of us are taking advantage of the opportunities uh, through health care reform um, and the National AIDS strategy to really look at our state health improvement plans and then our local impl implementation and local objectives and data that we need to uh, you know, be mining and better understanding. I think we're certainly taking advantage of uh, the opportunities through projects like the 12 Cities Project or the eChip Project to really look at our joint planning opportunities to think better about how we are creating the system system in a way that uh, you're better, a client's better able to navigate the system. I think um, we truly have a, a lesson to be learned from the Ryan White uh, Part D networks uh, that have been developed, uh, which serve women, infant, children, and youth. I know in Maryland we have a very strong network that involves um, faith-based communities, uh, community-based organizations, university-based clinics, uh, so Light Health and Wellness in Baltimore, Sisters Together and Reaching in Baltimore, University of Maryland, uh, and Johns Hopkins, and they really have um, come together and sit at the table with us on a monthly basis uh, to talk about that coordinated system of care um, and how do they work across prevention and care to make sure that women and girls are being uh, offered testing, are accessing care, are staying in care, um, and, and and are uh, talking about HIV uh, in their communities. Um, I think we do have some other opportunities with the Affordable Care Act, and I certainly think that in terms of how do we better integrate HIV testing and other prevention initiatives, uh, we do need to look at new and innovative ways to work in clinical settings, uh, working with provider offices, especially their business offices, to better understand the issues around reimbursement. Um, I still think there continues to be a perception, perhaps a reality, uh, that reimbursement is difficult for HIV testing um, that we need to work on. I think that we need to work with uh, providers to make sure that they're uh, working hand-in-hand -hand with their community-based organizations. Uh, there is a reality that their time is limited, and so partnering with community-based 
based organizations to deliver those HIV testing and prevention interventions could be a cost effective and a resource effective model in clinical settings. Um, I, I kind of think that it's impossible to navigate the healthcare system whether you're an HIV positive <laughs> woman or not. And, you know, maybe it's because I worked in a sort of under resourced public hospital, but I, 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 it is very hard. I'm sure everybody here has terrible stories of what they've been through themselves. Um, but I do, I do think that um, there have been a lot of attempts to deal with the obstacles. And, and I was lucky enough to work um, and help build a program that did have primary HIV care, dental services, obstetrics and gynae care in the same place, women and children seen together, psychiatry care, case management, m all mental health, chemical dependency, domestic violence counseling, pastoral care. And I just want to tell you like three quick examples of how people still fell through the cracks because there's just so much that has to, that no, it's just an impossible um, thing that we're actually asking to accomplish. I mean, we can do it. I'm a very optimistic person, but I'll just tell you three quick ones. A 30-year-old woman who came for care, um, she was admitted to the hospital with cervical cancer, late stage metastatic, with AIDS. She'd been, had an abnormal pap three years before while she was pregnant, never dealt with it because she had a lot else going on. Um, she'd only told her mother that she was HIV positive. She didn't make it. I mean, this is in the last four years. It's not just very long time ago. A 20-year-old, 8-year-old who was raped at 15 could never deal with the fact that she was infected, just, just could not cope. Um, and, uh, you know, wouldn't take medications, had a lot of other issues going on in her life, but um, multiple admissions for cryptococcal meningitis, late stage, and did not make it. There was a 45-year-old woman who was a t drug user her, for 20 years, came into the um, ICU, respiratory failure, TB, multiple other bacterial infections, somehow made it through everything we do to people in the ICU, and she did make it, stopped using drugs. Is, is, is still with us um, on medications on a good regimen. So what I get out of like the horror of obstacles that we put in front of people and people's very difficult lives is that there has to be a, a ambience of caring um, that allows people to actually come back to care when they leave care, because that's what people do. I mean, that's what women do that I've taken care of and that I learned from and with. Um, and men do this too. Um, and it's hard to stay in care and take medicines your, every single day of your life for your whole life, especially for young women. My experience in both Chicago and Rwanda is that especially young folks have a lot of trouble thinking of taking medicines for the rest of their life. So we just have to really allow there to be opportunities to address those issues. And then I think we'll be much better off. But I think the idea of advocating, having a buddy, peers is an essential aspect. And most importantly, um, we have to make sure the voices of women with HIV, which is so exciting that the panel started with that, are there to help us figure out the best way to do whatever we have to do. To, to keep it going. Thank you. We are really short on time, so I have to go on to the last question. Sorry. The last question is, how can we reduce stigma and discrimination so more women and girls receive the best care possible? Now, this can be a six-hour <laughs> response, but I'd like you to give me your quickest response. <laughs> okay. Um, one of the the things that we've lacked on the most, I think, is actually disseminating information around HIV and, and care. Um, I don't know how many of us outside of this room know that when a person is on medications that they cannot, you know, when they have a low viral load, that it's harder for them to, to pass the virus on. I mean, we're, we're not getting that information out to other settings, and so I think that Information dissemination is, is one of the, the key, key ways for us to, to address those issues. Um, you can go on. So our mantra in Maryland is talk, test, and treat. Because talking about HIV in all the variety of venues that have already been discussed is really the key to reduce stigma and discrimination. Um, and so, you know, public education, media campaigns like the Stopping AIDS is Everyone's Business, HIV Stops With Me, We Are Greater Than, I think those are great. Comprehensive sexual health education, I think, has already been covered and mentioned by the previous panel. Um, engaging our faith communities in our workplaces. And uh, I completely agree with uh, the couple of statements that have been made. The wisdom of the community, having HIV positive 
positive women leaders uh, speaking out uh, in, in various fora, I think is critically important to reducing stigma. I think in terms of testing, routinely testing, educating the healthcare workforce about the importance of testing and reducing systems barriers, of, as we've already talked about. And then in terms of treatment, engaging and staying in treatment is not just about HIV treatment. It's about substance abuse. It's about uh, domestic uh, intimate partner violence, uh, mental health, housing related concerns, sexually transmitted um, infections, viral hepatitis, and the whole host of other issues that need to be addressed. And if we're going to really reduce stigma and discrimination, we need to start with some of those other issues, often with our clients, instead of starting with the HIV. Mm, I think it's very difficult to figure it out because it's been so many years. And you know, we, I think we've come a long way, but we sort of haven't, we haven't clinched it yet in terms of stigma. I think, I think what it comes down to as a provider is taking people very seriously, not thinking of people as what, like their HIV infected, that people are whole people. Um, they come with a lot of other things besides HIV, take them extremely seriously, and, 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 and really be there for people with HIV so that in fact we figure out great ways to have people have the coping strategies to deal with the stigma. Of course, on the largest level, if we got rid of gender-based violence, if we dealt with poverty, if we actually felt, you know, did something about racism, and incredibly much so sensitize the providers um, as well as community leaders, we would be more clearly on the side of women with HIV. Thank you. Thank you so much. We um, have time for two questions. <laughs> So I saw the lady in the blue and I saw you. Thank you. Can it reach? Uh-oh, here. Um, my name is Vignetta Charles. I'm with AIDS United and we do fundraising, uh, funding policy and capacity building. We're a national organization based here in DC. And we actually have a very large access to care initiative with some of the, uh, with some of the um, projects that are specifically focused on women. And they do address many of the issues that you talked about in terms of having more comprehensive services, transportation, linking with peer navigators. And we also have a public-private partnership with the Social Innovation Fund at the White House. But our, our money is limited. And then Ryan White Part D, which um, Dr. Cohen talked about, which is, um, also has psychosocial support is often the first to get cut in states. So how do we keep um, sort of the focus on sort of the need for women in terms of these wraparound services given sort of the limited resources and that the psychosocial supports that we know are especially important for women and HIV and access to care on the radar? One easy, response. Easy question. <laughs> One response. <laughs> what are, you have to be in the streets, I think. I mean, there's so much going on right now in our country that is, tr is seems to be related to in, in insufficient funding for good for good programs. Um, I mean, the reason why there is around there was a Part D and there was research because of women with HIV was because people were out there saying it, they're demanding it, and I guess we just have to do that again. Thank you. Yes, ma'am, and that's it. I'm sorry. <laughs> start and say thank you very much uh, to the panelists and for the White House for organizing this panel. And uh, one of the greatest barrier to women's health is bad politics, you know, and it is the elephant in the room that we never discuss when we get together. Um, and when it comes especially to compre comprehensive sexual uh, reproductive health for women, we know that politics is driving that agenda right now. Um, we know that some of the resources to actually address the needs of women, uh, also it's politics that is driving it. So my question to you, the panelists and the previous panelists, and to Congresswoman uh, Christensen, um, how do we as AIDS activists, women's activists, how are we going to take on this agenda of bad politics to really address the needs of women and girls? Thank you. I think it's your, it's your I office. I'd, I'd like to thank you for that question. Um, I think that, that you're right. There is lots of politics involved in it and I think um, my focus in, in getting a women's health degree is to try to bridge the gap between HIV and sexual reproductive health. 
Um, see, one of the things that, that we, that's why I'm really happy and excited that Congressman, Congresswoman Christensen is in the room, is that we are at a loss for, for leaders in places where decisions can be made. And so if we're going to constantly be on the other end of the spectrum in terms of advocating and, and I mean, we can't, we can't even lobby, really. We just have to kind of advocate and educate. It put us at a disadvantage. And so, I mean, I, I try to, to tell people whenever I come in contact with them that, um, you know, there is an opportunity for you to, to, to affect change. And it would just mean simply trying to push women like ourselves to run for office. Um, and that way, whenever these things come up in Congress, we have allies there to, to push agendas forward. Um, so that would be one of my, my ways to try to, to combat the issue. Thank you very much. I know, I know, yes. Oh, Donna, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you for that question. And it, you know it's going to be more difficult. We, all, we had a pretty good shot last Congress, but we didn't. So I mean, elections matter. <laughs> you got to work for candidates that you know support your um, issues and, and your needs. And yes, run for office. But it also takes, I mean, a, a lot of us are from all over the country. We all have our own representatives. We all have our, our Senate. Well, some people have senators. I don't have one. <laughs> but, um, you know, gather some folks and go and let them know that this is important to you and that they need your vote. Thank you. I'm pleased to give our panelists who had, uh, were short on time, but excellent on information. Thank you. <laughs> And we'll be around. Shinto? So thank you so much to Francis and panel two. Um, our next panel and our final panel actually will discuss effective strategies such as social marketing and media that target women, young women and girls for social marketing campaigns. The moderator for this panel is Mark Ishag. Mark recently joined AIDS United as their new president and CEO last month. He came to AIDS United after serving 13 years as president and CEO of, AIDS, of the AIDS Foundation of Chicago. Under his leadership there, Mark developed in innovative initiatives to promote an awareness of and, array, and raise funds for HIV AIDS. Let's welcome Mark in panel three. Not me. <clears throat> you can have you. Thank you. You're a good Jew. Oh, perfect. All right. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's such an honor to be here with all these powerful women and men. Uh, I'm very honored to be here. I've only been on this job, as she said, about six weeks. So I'm feeling very green, uh, even though I've been around for a long, long time. And I had to divert for one second of our very limited 30 minutes uh, just to say that I've been doing this work for 25 years, um, and Marge Cohen, who was just up here, is one of uh, my inspirations. Uh, I met her my first day on the job, I think, uh, and she really has inspired me for the whole time. She's a doctor, so she's annoyed me a lot of the time, too, uh, as the doctors do uh, in their very powerful way to get the services that they need for their clients. But I just got to say, in all of my work, uh, Chicago's a different place because of Dr. Cohen. Rwanda's a different place because of Dr. Cohen. Uh, and we're eliminating perinatal transmission in this country uh, because of Dr. Cohen and a whole bunch of other people. So thank you for, for inspiring me. Uh, so I have the job today of just standing up here and moderating uh, this very distinguished and brilliant panel. Uh, and I'm joined today right here on my left by my very dear friend and another hero, uh, Regan Hoffman, uh, the editor and chief of Paws Magazine and the editorial director of Smart and Strong. Uh, this is the multimedia health information company that has a whole bunch of brands uh, under, its, uh, under its name focused on health and, and wellness. Uh, Regan's a, an award-winning journalist, uh, an author, a woman living with HIV, and one of the fiercest and most articulate advocates in the fight against AIDS. I, how I moderate her today, I have no idea. Uh, to uh, next, uh, well, I'm going to go right down to the end and then come back to Susan, uh, is Dr. Cheryl Smith uh, on the end there, the founder of the Mount Morris Medical uh, Center, a primary care practice in Harlem, 
and she's the lead clinician now at the Brownsville Multi-Service Family Health Center in Brooklyn. Yes. Yeah, so she's, she's all over the place. She's also the Associate Medical Director of Clinical Services at New York State Department of Health's AIDS Institute, where she directs clinical education initiatives and chairs the social media work group. I do not know how, how you get through the day. Uh, and I stopped her biography very quickly. Uh, and last but not least, uh, our middle guest here uh, is Susanna Fox, the Associate Director of the Pew Research Center's Internet and American Life Project. Uh, Susanna is an anthropologist and a journalist by training, uh, but she describes herself as an internet geologist. I just love that idea. So she researches and studies rocks, she says, but she doesn't judge them. She leaves the judging to us. Uh, so uh, she has also researched the social, how do I say it, the social life of health information. Uh, as well as the role the internet plays among people living with chronic diseases. Uh, and so that's why I went last with Susanna, because I'd like you to start uh, by talking about your experience, uh, your research, in fact, uh, on the internet, and especially how girls uh, and women both utilize the information, uh, utilize the in internet, uh, and how they're affected by that internet. Thank and you other so services. much. Thank you. Um, so how many people here know exactly where their cell phone is right now? <laughs> this is the reality of the information landscape at this point. Um, what we find is that 9 out of 10 teenagers are online. If we're just looking at 14 to 17 year olds, 8 and 10, if they're online, use social networking sites. 8 and 10 have a cell phone. Um, the numbers uh, continue um, to be high among uh, women, adult women, and really only start to drop down around age 65. This has really changed the information landscape. Um, what we find in our research is that information has gone mobile, it's gone social, and we've heard a lot today about the powerful women who can teach all of us. And what we've seen in the research is that the internet has changed from being an information vending machine to being a two-way communications device. And mobile social tools are allowing people to be peer educators within their own Facebook groups. They're able to be peer educators using text messaging. Um, and so the most powerful message that I have for you is you can't control the conversation. <laughs> we all know that. But you can contribute to it. Thank you. Great, thank you. So Cheryl, why don't you follow up on that? Given that you work in the public sector, which must make the challenges of marketing and social marketing challenging, uh, as well as a community-based health center with very limited resources. Right, I, I think what I'll do is actually talk about one of the other sectors that I live in that will inform both my public health sec portion and my clinical practice. And it's a real tangible um, example of how we, we can do this. One is I'm a parent, right? I'm a parent. I'm a very, very active family member. So I'm almost a mother to my, niece, my nieces. And one of the things that we found is the fact that one of my niece and also my, my niece, an older niece that's 20, 19, 19, about to be 20, couldn't find her. Oftentimes, where her mother is frustrated with her, as you all know, she's an older teenager, young woman at this point, and she just was not listening to what we had to say as it relates to prevention messages, which is what we do in public health, right? We try to protect the public, um, especially in terms of um, health care. Well, one of the things, she is an avid social media person. I mean, she knows everything known to mankind as, as a, what's coming, what's going. So she's on Foursquare, she's on Twitter, she's on Facebook all at the same time. And what we decided to do as a family was to track her. <laughs> <laughs> and literally. So we, I can tell you where she is at every like 15 to half an hour increments, literally. So I can, I can say, well, she is in Soho right now, and she's, a, she's the mayor of this particular spot um, at, at that particular time. And 
then I could look on her Facebook page at exactly what she's doing. So one of the things that we did, I mean, first of all, it, you have to do this in a non-judgmental manner. As her mother, her mother couldn't do it properly because she was judgmental. And then she, once we figure out a strategy for how to handle this situation um, in terms of maybe having high risk behaviors, then what we did was we tracked her. We decided we would track and then subtly provide prevention messages, right? Subtly. But as a parent, it's very hard to do the subtle part. Um, so what we did was we tracked her, where, her locations. We looked at her Facebook and Twitter messages for what it is that she's engaged in. Um, one particular, I won't go into anything because then she'll kill me, but one particular, she wanted to get a tattoo, right? Fine, not a problem. So we tracked that. She's telling her friends where she's going to get it done, what she's going to do. So for, I, for me, as a healthcare person, I'm concerned about where is she going to get it done, right? So what I did was I'm tracking where, she ha where she's saying she's going to get it done. And what we did was we subtly around s sent her via other people on her Facebook and her Twitter pages to, um, to the appropriate places that where she could do it safely, right? And she actually went there. She didn't necessarily know that I was the one that did it. <laughs> because then if I sent her, she wouldn't have gone. She really wouldn't have. So one of the things that I find that's probably, and, and the public health sector is missing this, is we do not engage in active social listening on all of our, so, our social media t or new technology tools. And I think that's the next phase of where we have to go in order for us to be truly effective. Because if we engage in social listening to what is going on, um, then we can potentially develop strategies that are very effective. We can look at, we can trend behaviors as they're going on. Um, it takes much shorter times periods for us to be able to do that. So that's one of the things I think that we, that's one of the most, I think one of the things that we will have to do in order to be much more effective. Well, Regan, I think this is a perfect follow-up. Um, I love Pause Magazine. I'm on it all the time. Um, <laughs> I think you get four million insane hits a month or something, or pet page views, I think is the proper word. So a lot of people are going to pause. And, um, and my belief is that you are listening, and people at pause are listening. So can you tell me a little bit about what you're hearing from women and girls? Um, because I think they are talking, not directly to you, but they're talking to and through pause, and how you're talking to them, and how you use pause and the websites and other forms of media and social media to listen uh, and hear these women and girls. Great. Well, it's on. It's on. Okay, great. Um, thank you so much. And also, I just want to thank the White House for having me here today and also just to say how inspired I am by all of the women in this room. It is truly a remarkable day. Awareness days come and go, and all of us doing this fight need a shot in the arm, and this is like 20 B12 shots, so thanks. Um, <laughs> We do. We have hundreds of thousands of users online every month at pause.com. And it's changed. In the five years since I've come to the magazine, I've watched it. It's like a coral reef that lives and breathes and moves underneath our noses. I contracted HIV in 1996 when I had stopped hearing the messages. In the 80s, I was paranoid. I was dragging people to get HIV tests. I was dragging my virgin friends to get HIV tests. I had no idea, you know? I was so paranoid, but when the messaging stopped, so did my vigilance. And that's exactly when the virus entered my life in 1996. I was on birth control. I was aware. I was careful. But HIV wasn't on my radar. Um, as you've heard through all the presentations today, and as we all know, the message is not getting out there. And that's borne out by the data. Um, but luckily, we do have this new medium to, to communicate through. And you know, we've talked about 
changing, for example, the sex education program in schools. That's going to take a long time, and that's going to be difficult. We don't have to wait. With social media, what Cheryl just said is dead on the money. Parents can watch where their children are. Know that your Facebook um, page for your child is probably one of seven, you know, and that they know that you're watching them. So embedding messaging and sharing information with people who will then embed it in their communities and will be leaders to take it in. I live in suburban New Jersey, and so I have a lot of young women who are trying to get their sex education through me because they won't get it at school and they won't get it from their parents. Um, so I have you know, embedded messages or asked them to go to places and, and get the information. Um, there's no question that we've created this viral community, and it's a w weird word, obviously, for HIV, but it's, um, it's safer for people. There's still, because of the stigma, so much inability for people to come forward, and we have an opportunity to both listen and communicate. Um, and just quickly, I think the messaging that's out there for women, we've touched on it in a lot of different ways. The core is really self-empowerment and self-esteem, and that's where it starts. And whether you're talking to a, an 11-year-old child, and by the way, I am the first one to not want to talk about sex to an 11-year-old, but if my 11-year-old was getting into a car, I wouldn't want them to just drive the car without some advice. So whether we like it or not, they're doing it, and we need to teach them how to do it safely. And, um, and, I, and we've seen that when we educate, people are more likely to A, a do it better, and B, do it later. So there's no question about that. Um, the empowering messages and the connections. I mean, women are, we are such an incredible force when we connect to one another and give each other the support that we can't find out in society at large. I've seen women go from death's door to entering the forums on pause.com or being connected to a community and they're rural, they're isolated, they're disenfranchised, you're right, HIV is not the first thing on their minds, but when they get together and other women give them license to correct their health, they'll do it. Thank you. Susanna, I think a, a lot of public funders and private funders don't want to pay for social marketing. They say sort of, what is it? Uh, does it work? You know, is it effective? What is your response to all of those questions? Um, what we see is that um, the conversations that are happening are happening in private, um, and the, the peer education um, that's happening um, is is happening not necessarily on Facebook. The what you want to do is free the information that you have so that other people can share it. Um, and what we find is that um, if you make something easy to share, the really important information that that you as an individual hold or your organization holds, make it as easy to share as possible. Make it so that somebody can email it privately because we, we have found that um, when there's something sensitive, people want to, to keep it private um, and, and not necessarily post it on Facebook. Um, but make it easy for people to share and they, they often will share it. And um, what we find is that people, especially living with chronic disease or who have gone through a significant health change in the past year, are um, more likely than other people to look online for someone like them. Um, people are still going to health professionals with their major health questions, but um, the advice that you get from someone just ahead of you on the path is actually going to be even more powerful than anything that you might get from an institution. Yeah, I just wanted to follow that up with uh, part of my responsibilities as well is actually providing clinical education. And what we find in New York State um, guidelines, we prepare guidelines. One of the things that we find that continues to be a very, very high utilization is our guidelines on syphilis and hepatitis. So that continues to be a real driver for us. We find that people are, are looking for that information online. And just to piggyback on the prior question, specifically around the how uh, health centers um, and actually in clinical institutions can potentially use new media. Uh, one of the things that we're finding is actually using text messaging specifically amongst young women in general um, is extremely helpful as it relates to getting them to their appointments. So it's extremely, extremely helpful as it relates to getting, reminding people about their appointments and engaging them in care so that way they can stay, remain in care. So that's been ex very helpful. Regan? 
Yeah, I just want to piggyback off of um, Susanna's point that our information is shared on 300 social sites. I don't even know what half of them are. And you know, it depends on what age you are, whether you're on Tumblr, Tumblr or StumbledUpon or all of these other sites. There's a baby Facebook I haven't even figured out yet. And they change all the time. But to your point, um, when the information is passed along, not by paws, but taken from paws, where it's accurate, hopefully, and then passed along by a peer, that's where it really gets taken in. Um, and also, I think the other way is to listen in, um, mm -hmm. because you have such an ability to do research. And obviously, it's not as clinical um, or structured as we'd like. But we hear so much first um, at pause because we're listening to the street. We're listening to the rumblings. And we're hearing you know, that it's, it's daycare. It's um, that women are putting their own selves first. It's not HIV. That's not their main problem. And so listening to your audience and feeding that back and then figuring out that's what we do, trying to figure out solutions then for those primary concerns for people. But um, I think that knowing also the, the fear of privacy is increases as you get older. I think for older women, and I, we have a real range of ages here, but you know, you go from people in their tweens and teens sharing everything and too much to people in their 40s and 50s being afraid to be on Facebook. So we have to adjust you know, for that. I'm trying to get my mom on Facebook, but I sort of don't want her on Facebook. So, so, so I've been told we have to move on, but before we do that, for the 10 minute q and if, if you were able to convince NBC or ABC or some network or not network to run one series of PSAs to use millions of dollars of their money for a social marketing campaign, what would you do? I would show women and people living with HIV engaged with other people and debunk these basic myths. 30 years in, yes, you can swim in a pool with me. Yes, you can hug me. Yes, you can drink out of my soda can. We still have to go back to the basics. Um, but I think people living with HIV are the answer, and we have to make the environment safe for them to come forward, and then we have to show that there are literally millions of them out there, and they're normal. Susanna? I'll give my time over. We're sort of normal. Oh. <laughs> well, sure. I, I, I actually think that the actually put in time into routine testing. I, I really believe um, looking at just providing health care in general and getting women into care um, to, uh, to fra the phrase that I love is the self-compassion. Um, that phrase that I love to teach women to really look at themselves and care about themselves first. Um, and to really get themselves looked at and to love themselves. I think that would be the PSA. Because I, I do think the issue is not, it's, it's not just HIV. It is all of these other things. It's class, it's race, it's, it's poverty. And, and I think those, that's a uh, pretty important um, Perfect. Message. Awesome. Can you please give a warm welcome and thank you. Please. You can stay there. So we have about 10 minutes for questions and answers, and I will start right there in the back. And do you need a mic? Oh, it's a long microphone. Well, and I also have to say for this last 10 minutes of Q&A, is that right, before we move on, uh, that anyone, we're not putting the pressure on these panelists here, uh, Jeff can answer, uh, Chantel can answer. Oh, Jeff, uh, any panelist that spoke before can answer, or really anybody who wants to talk can talk, right? So who's going to, I love Anna Forbes too, I'm so glad she's here. Who, uh, who's going to answer that question? Uh, Jeff, I would love you to answer that question. Don't put them on this. I'll even leave my name tag up there for you. Well, the issue of sex workers, you know, it, it wasn't mentioned. I would say a couple things. One of our challenges in the strategy wasn't to 
identify every group that's at high risk. It's really talk about where, where we're focusing our attention. And it wasn't to omit that. But you know, a lot of the focus on sex work, the epidemiology is, looks very different in this country. And they're much smaller um, population um, in the United States than other places. It doesn't mean they're not important. Hopefully, though, the issues we talk about in the strategy about targeting, and in the same way that we address transgender. Transgender um, populations contribute very few infections compared to the overall pool nationally, but they're at very high risk, and we call them out, and I think you can make similar observations about sex workers. So I think in specific communities, we need to think about how we focus on that. And as we really talk about you know, driving our resources, targeting to the local epidemics, I think this could come, come to play um, more prominently in some local areas th than in other places as well. Thanks, Jeff. And before we take the next question, do you, you want to respond yeah. to that too? I think it's important to think about just the kinds of transactions women may have for survival. Within that is sex work, but also within that is women who may not be able to or maybe or I can't say willing, but are unable to really negotiate safer sex because that can mean the difference between food on your table, your children getting to school, a roof over your head. And if you want to, for some women it may be an organized sort of approach to survival that you may call sex work, but for many women it's also just an organized approach toward their daily lives where they may not view themselves as sex workers. I'm not sure that necessarily singling out one group versus another will help as much as being able to have the discussions with both men and women about how people need to protect themselves and protect themselves against HIV, but also putting forth all the energy, time, money, and research that's necessary to look at developing ways that women can protect themselves. Thank you, Janet. Uh, in the back, in the white. Good afternoon. My name is Victoria Kirby. I'm a second year graduate student at Howard University here in Washington, D.C. And um, I have a question um, in reference to the social media piece. With so many messages on the internet, and particularly in the social media platforms, advertisements, other um, organizations who are also vying for people's time and attention, how have you been able to distinguish um, your message um, on the social media platforms, particularly to our young women who may be more interested in what Justin Bieber has to say than what you know, we're saying about health. And so I just want to know what you guys have done in your experiences to really distinguish your messages to get it out there. Um, we do two things. We look at real-time responses to what works. Um, masturbation as a headline works very well. Anything with sex. Um, literally, we, 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 we look at what people are responding to and we put messages there. Um, we also use people who are getting a lot of attention. When Lady Gaga tweets about safe sex, it's very helpful. You know, we, you have to use the people that are already getting the attention. So I think those are two, listen to your audience and use what's already working. Great, thank you. And we're gonna have time for one more question after this question, so you. Yes. Um, hi, my name is Hemley Ardoñez, and um, I'm from Advocates for Youth. Um, and my question is um, related to sort of in intersectionalities in social media um, and who has access, um, especially when you're talking about you know communities that we want to be targeting are low income of color. Um, and so, how are you sort of able to branch out and reach those communities um, when there are access barriers? And how do you sort of um, build cross messaging um, to make sure that you are reaching the forums because of the nichification in social media. Also, by the way, I've been live tweeting the whole time. So, <laughs> thank you so much. And Susanna and Cheryl are both going to respond. Thank you so much. Um, and I'll look at your tweets later. Um, <laughs> Well, what we find um, is that mobile is really changing the internet access equation. Um, when people um, have smartphones, um, it, it, um, they are now uh, using the internet in a different way, um, and access is going into new communities. Um, communities that are still offline include recent immigrants, um, people age 65 and older, really 70 and older, um, and um, people with lower levels of education. Um, and, and I could go on. You can imagine what, what all of the populations are who are offline. 
um, which is why mobile is a really important um, marker for, mm -hmm. for people to keep your eye on in yeah. terms of what access is. And um, one note about that is that we, we have found that people are starting to look for health information using their cell phones. And according to Yahoo's data, actually three out of five of the top health search terms using their mobile um, platform are um, sex related. Um, and so th what we see is that the mobile internet is pretty much the ultimate, just in time, wherever you are, information resource. Just, just in terms of commenting, I, I know that there was a question earlier about how do you reach that faith-based community because you could not distribute or distribute information that you wanted um, in the church itself. I think social media and new technologies, mobile especially, enables you to reach that faith-based community because if you're in that particular um, community, you can give them where you are online. And that's what I've found in some, some of the churches in New York, that that's what they're doing. So we may not be able to go in and say penis or, or use terms that they would not necessarily approve of, but what we do is reach out to them and say, come to us for this. And people have reached out um, in, in, in that manner. So I think that's, another, I think that's one way that the church faith-based community's walls will be significantly expanded by new media. Hi, thank you for taking the time to, to um, give me an opportunity to present a question. Um, my name is Athena Moore, and I'm the Director of Public Policy for the National Black Leadership Commission on AIDS, and I also handle the National Black Women's Conversation Initiative through our organization. Um, I'm excited to hear this conversation because we just launched a new campaign, 30 Years Strong, and it's a social uh, marketing campaign, and it, it tries to take advantage of uh, many of the recommendations that I've made. Uh, what we find is that when you're dealing with faith-based communities, which is part of our audience, as well as with a volunteer base, a strong volunteer base, that is very difficult to you know, access the resources as needed. So I'm underscoring just the critical importance of that ongoing, but also um, asking all of you, you know, what success have you had? Uh, we talked about funding only briefly and really establishing those sort of collaborative relationships to put those proposals out there that get um, social marketing and messaging um, opportunities funded. Uh, we have uh, recruited uh, pharmaceuticals to get involved with us and we're continuing to try to engage others but I know that the challenge of, of resources is always just ever present. Well New York, uh, just a little plug, New York State Department of Health uh, recently held a social media conference uh, where we dealt with some of the issues of funding. Clearly social media or new technologies are fairly, it seems inexpensive, um, but it does take funding to do this. A lot of it is re human resource funding. Twitter, Facebook, all of these things are free to get engaged in. But one of the most important things that I think is one, having a strategic plan and integrating that strategic communications plan with your overall organizational plan and getting the right personnel and the right skills in order to do it. I, I think that it's a conversation that I think at the federal and state level that we really need to have in terms of how it is that we fund um, these technologies. Uh, and part of, uh, and I think part of the, maybe one of the limitations for that is we're still so early on as it relates to the evaluation of the impact and the outcomes of the technologies. I mean, I could, we can give you anecdotal stories, but when we're looking at overall organizations, what is the ultimate impact on, on clients' behavior or um, uh, Let's talk about adherence to medications because that's another way that we can use, we have used ta um, the technology in order to get people to be much more adherent or appointments. So I think we're, we're fairly early on, but I think that is, it's, it's a great question and we have the right people in the room to ask some of the questions as it relates to funding, um, funding initiatives around new technologies. Uh, but I, I think that needs to happen next because it's really, I think, um, part of the new frontier in terms of listening first, then developing strategic actions for what happens after the listening process. And I'm going to let Regan have the last word on this. 
Um, she's, she's it's a huge opportunity that we have to catch up with quickly. When, you know, when I started in magazines, it was magazines, then to websites. We went to, um, you know, basically putting the content online. Now we're a daily newspaper that is 24-7. So we have so many more needs and the hunger for the information and the responsiveness of the community. I can communicate in real time to hundreds of thousands of people if I don't sleep and none of my staff sleeps, you know? <laughs> so we have the ability to do it. We need the resources and it would be terrific if we worked as a group to convince people of the validity of this. It's measurable, it works immediately, and again, we employ the whole world with us when we do, the, when we do social networking. So we get the world to help us out. Thank you. So a big round of applause to the panelists and to all of you. Can I, Mark, can I just say one quick thing? Oh. Um, just, I'm sorry, I'll be one quick second. Only because I have, I will neglect my International AIDS uh, Society responsibilities. We did talk about 2012. Women's health is extremely, extremely important. Uh, Tiffany is here, um, so please, if you have questions, you want to participate, you have ideas in how to deal with women and girls specifically at the conference and how it is that we can push the agenda as it relates to that, see myself or Tiffany, we're more than happy to get your ideas, your concepts and the like. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, okay, and uh, we are very, very lucky today to have closing remarks uh, by Tina Chen, uh, the Chief of Staff to First Lady Michelle Obama. It's such an honor for me as a Chicagoan to be able to welcome her to this podium. Uh, I feel like I've known her forever as well. Uh, a powerhouse lawyer, an amazing community organizer, a great and well, beyond great philanthropist. Um, and uh, according to our friend Jan Schakowsky, Congresswoman Jan Schakowsky, uh, Tina sleeps four hours a day and always <laughs> smiles and laughs as she just did for us. Uh, so we are so fortunate uh, to have with us today uh, a great leader, a great woman, um, and a great chief of staff, uh, <laughs> Tina Chen. Welcome. <laughs> I had no idea I was going to get to welcome you. <laughs> this is great. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you, thank you, Mark, and um, uh, thank you all for being here. I know you've been here for, for several hours um, already, and for that, let me start by acknowledging that and thanking you all for taking the time to be here um, and to address this important issue. Um, I am here to both um, convey in my capacity as the Chief of Staff of the First Lady um, her regards, um, but also in my capacity, I have two hats. Nobody does one thing in this White House. Everybody does multiple things. Um, I I'm also the executive director of the White House Council on Women and Girls. And in that capacity, I want to convey the President's um, uh, greetings and thanks to all of you for the work that you are doing. Um, the Council on Women and Girls, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, um, was actually found, you are actually here, now that I realize it, on the two-year anniversary, oh, the two-year anniversary was, was, was uh, yesterday for, of the Council on Women and Girls. So, you know, this is, uh, we were created. <laughs> We were, we were created as um, uh, in the, the first year of the administration um, to really be how we he here push forward um, women and girls policy and we do it throughout the agencies. Um, it's a council that is made up of all of the federal agencies and all the major White House offices so that really everybody um, gets the message from the president that every part of the federal government has responsibility to um, pay attention to and work on the needs of women and girls and especially on this issue. Um, I'm so pleased that you are here today to, to call attention to, and especially with the theme of the day of taking action for women and girls. Um, and you have had some great leadership here today. I mean, I really want to thank the Congresswoman for being here and for her many years of leadership um, in, in this area. Um, for Francis, um, the HHS Office of Women's Health is an important partner with the Council, um, has been since our beginning, um, and your, your leadership on this. Um, I have to acknowledge Marge, too, because <laughs> Marge and Marge going to known each other for years and years in the trenches, your Cook County Hospital days, you know, all the way back um, to the beginning. And so it's really great to see you here. I'm so delighted you're here. Um, and then, of course, Jeff Crowley. Um, Jeff has really, you know, what he has been able to do on AIDS and HIV policy, really being the spirit and the force behind the national strategy, um, really always taking care to make sure that we address the needs of vulnerable populations 
We've done several things when we started in the beginning work on the national strategy and then as we've um, continued that work since it was issued um, uh, last year to really focus you know, on minority populations, on women, and today's um, uh, session on women and girls is really representative of his leadership and his work, and I'm really grateful, Jeff, to, 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 every, to everything that you do. Um, I'm really here just to convey that, to convey our thanks to you um, as an administration. Um, you know, one of the things, as you all know from the president, he realizes that as um, community, as an old community organizer himself, that it's in communities, you know, that solutions, you know, really take hold, um, that where, you know, problems really get solved and where you really understand because you are working with the people who are in need um, every day. And so um, I'm really pleased that we were able to have this session today to, you know, give you a chance to communicate with each other, to communicate with us, um, to convey the information and the experience and the knowledge that you have. Um, to challenge us, which I am sure I heard you just did right now, <laughs> and I'm sure it's been happening all day. Um, and, and but that's what we need. Um, not, and challenge not just us, but the rest of the policymakers here um, in Washington um, to keep to keep an eye on this issue and to keep moving forward. Um, the national strategy was just a start, uh, but an important framework to underscore you know the commitment that the president has and really the entire administration has um, to addressing HIV and AIDS, um, and especially again, as I said. Um, underscoring the, the needs of women and girls is, is so important. So thank you very much. And it's the end of a very long day. Um, um, thank you for all the work that you have done, the work that you will do. Um, and we look forward to doing that in partnership with all of you. Um, so thank you. And let me turn the podium back over to Jeff. Please. Well, my job is just to say thank you very much. Have a good weekend. No, we're, um, we're glad you came. Um, this was actually a really rich discussion, and hopefully it will continue. If you have other ideas or thoughts, share them with us. But you know, I always sort of reinforce to people, not all roads lead to us. Hopefully we're a catalyst of a lot of creative thinking, and hopefully you'll meet a lot of people here and keep talking amongst yourselves and, and sharing ideas. Um, I do think we have a lot of momentum with our strategy and where we're trying to go as a nation, and we look forward to continuing to work with, with you as we, as we seize the moment and do great things. Thank you.